Hello all and welcome to the Rails Board Orientation Meeting. This is Friday, July 22nd, 2022. I am Thomas Stagg, President of the Rails Board. I call this meeting to order at 9.02. Uh, Stacy, will you please call roll? Yes, Monica Caldicott. Here. Rosie Camargo. Here. Alice Creason. Here. Juanita Harrell. Here. Robin Hellenthal. Diane Hollister. Here. Renee Leva. Here. Jennifer McIntosh. Julie Milovic. Here. Becky Spradford. Tom Stack. Here. Belt Tepin. Here. Alex Vancina. Here. Vanessa Villarell. Here. Karen Boytet. Here. We have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Stacy. Uh, the participants will notice that all Rails Committee and board meetings will now have the closed, sec closed caption setting activated. The captioning will appear on the large main screen of the Rails meeting rooms and also activated by users on their laptops. We will handle guests and public comments at the same time. Uh, we'll start here in Burr Ridge. Deirdre, Deirdre Brennan, Rails. Monica Harris, Rails. Sharon Swanson, Rails. Mark Hatch, Rails. Grant Halter, Rails. Jeanette Durucki, Rails. Stacey Palmisano, Rails. Karen Ryan. <laughs> Karen Boyer, Rails. Ryan Hebel, Rails. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, we have no guests in East Peoria. So, right. Uh, uh, we have guests on Zoom. Do okay. we have guests on Zoom at this point? Okay. Stacy, will you read the names of the guests that are participating via Zoom? Yes. Ann Slaughter, Dan Bostrom, Joe Philippek, Layla Heath. No. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Deidre is next with the welcome and introductions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so thank you all for being on the Rails board. And thank you all for coming here today. Uh, and thank you all for being on Zoom as well. Uh, speaking of Zoom, uh, th what the orientation today involves a lot of rail staff uh, presenting what they do. Um, and so we decided it was it was better for them to just do it from their offices because they have more room. Um, this room gets pretty crowded, so they're not they're not uh, unfriendly. They're just, uh, it's just, just, just more effective that way. So but they'll be here uh, for lunch, et cetera. So just if you're wondering why they're not here. So um, I thought that, you know, maybe we could just go around and do brief introductions of the board members, the staff, you'll, you'll hear from them later. So I think we'll just do the board for now. So you want to start, Mr. Chair? Oh, okay. Mr. President? I, I'll start. I'm Tom Stagg. I'm uh, with trustee at Alpha Park Public Library just outside of Peoria and been on rails for four years now. This is my fourth year. So uh, you had to put up with me for a couple more years. So. That's good. We're uh, glad to do that. <laughs> so I'm Julie Millebeck. I'm the director of the Downers Grove Public Library, and I have spent my entire career in suburban Chicago libraries. So not only have I worked at a Rails library, I worked at a library in when it was SLF, <laughs> Prairie uh, Pals, um, Heritage Trail, uh, DuPage library system back in the day. So uh, I have, although this is my first term on a library system board, I'm very familiar with library systems and where they I'm Diane Hollister, and I'm from Bloomington, Illinois. I'm a trustee uh, with the Bloomington Public Library, retired librarian from Peoria Public Library and Bradley University. And I used to be on ILA board as director of ARCH 2008-2011. And um, I've been on Rails since 2019, and um, right now chair of and I've had a wonderful experience. Hi, my name is Renee Leva. I'm the library director at Foster Ridge Public Library District and uh, located in Braidwood. We represent 10 towns there. 
Uh, I'm going to add a little fun fact. Uh, <laughs> my, both of my, I have two, I have three sisters. Both, uh, two of them are twins, and they're both managers at two different libraries. <laughs> uh, so libraries are in our blood. Like, <laughs> um, a funny thing, though, is they started working in libraries when they were 16, and I started working in libraries uh, starting six years ago. And the, again, this is part of the fun fact. Uh, as soon as I started working, uh, they got to do, be known as Renee's sister. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but um, this is for me, I'm very uh, excited to see where we can go with Rails. I'm also with Julie here and maybe, maybe some of you. Uh, I'll be in the, or I'm in the conference committee for ILA. Huh. And then uh, hopefully joining the uh, finance committee for uh, Prairie Cat. So. Great. Busy. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm Karen Voidick. I am um, with the Shorewood Troy Public Library. I'm the secretary on the board there. And I'm a treasurer on the board of the Friends Group in Shorewood also. Um, this is my second year here at Rails. I don't really have any fun facts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those were fun. I have a lot of not fun facts. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Beth Teppen. I'm the president of the Silvis Library Board. So I'm from the Quad Cities. All the eastern uh, Quad Cities towns just kind of flow together. So I live in Silvis. I work in East Moline. I'm a school librarian. So it's been several years since I've been on the board, but it's worked out very nicely because I'm on Zoom most of the time and I don't have to leave the school and get a sub and all of that kind of stuff. But I do really enjoy coming here in person because I want to meet people and you know connect with people personally. I feel like I have a better opportunity to just have conversation outside of you know the discussions held in the meeting. So I welcome you all. I've been on the board a little while and uh, I'm learning as I go. I'll have to say that first year is just overwhelming. There's so <laughs> many new things. Uh, and I've been a librarian for quite a few years within Prairie Cat. And even then, you know, like coming up to the Rails level, I've had to, you know, like think about all those additional libraries out there, the other types of libraries, all the, you know, services and things like that that Rails provides because I have said it many times, um, I think of Rails as the delivery, you know? <laughs> I'm very, very interested in what happens with delivery. But there are a lot of other services that Rails provides and develops, and so I've learned a lot, and I'm sure you all will as well. Hi, I'm Monica Collicott. Um, my previous name in library world was Monica Tolba. I just got married in May. Um, I have a great library last name. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> Good last name. Um, and so I'm the a school librarian at Vernon Hills High School in Vernon Hills, Illinois, in Northern Lake County. Um, I am the solo school librarian there. And so like Beth, sometimes it's hard to arrange subs and get here, but um, I am so glad to be the school library member on this board. And I hope to be a great ambassador of all the things that Rails can do um, for my fellow school librarians who may think that it is delivery only and they don't do that or they don't know what that is or you know they just don't have time to think about how way, how the how um rails can help them and support them and advocate for them so i'm glad i get to do that here i've had um many experiences in school in libraries i was an elementary school public librarian and um academic librarian so i always say i've had them from kindergarten to college and they're not that much different. <laughs> so that's me. And I'm glad to be here. I, I'm sort of I'm still I'm still in the new category, um, although I joined the board to fill a vacancy a little bit earlier than my new um, board members. Uh, I'm Alice Creason and I am representing I'm a library trustee. I'm the board vice president at the Richton Park Public Library District in South Suburban Cook County. 
And in my daytime job, I am the head of technology and technical services at Lewis University. So I'm also academic librarian and public library trustee. Um, I've always worked in academic libraries. And so being a public library trustee was a huge learning curve for me. And then being on Rails, um, you know, it's really getting to see like the, the, the learning about school libraries and the issues facing school libraries and public libraries uh, has been like open, open a whole new world for me and it's been a huge learning experience and I'm really grateful for it, so. I am Vanessa Villarreal. I am a trustee for the Lake Villa District Library in Lake Villa, Illinois. It's in um, northern, um, northern Illinois, it's closer to the Wisconsin border. I'm also a full-time youth and school services librarian for the Vernon area public library. Yeah, <laughs> I'm everywhere. I've been, um, libraries have been a big part of my life since I was a young girl and I just really um, just wanna keep doing things in libraries. I really love it. I think it's a really great opportunity for people in communities that don't have a lot to really gain a lot. Um, that's kind of what happened with me. I grew up very, not on like the rich side or anything, but the library really helped me gain a lot of knowledge and the librarians there really helped me look for resources to help get to where I am today, which is really nice. I'm also a recent uh, graduate from Marshall School of Business from the USC. Um, I got my master's in um, library and information science, management and library and information science. So I'm hoping to be a director one day. But for now, I'm just going to gain some more experience and get um, <laughs> what you out. wish for. <laughs> <laughs> True. But yeah, that's uh, me in a nutshell. Just love libraries and just want to keep uh, making a difference and helping um, staff and other people just get what they need to, to be successful in their careers. Hi, I'm Alex Mancina, uh, library trustee, vice president of the New Lenox Public Library Board. And uh, I've also worked in Illinois libraries for a little over 20 years. Uh, now going back to the Heritage Trails days at the Manhattan Elm <laughs> Library. Oh. Um, I'm uh, also a librarian. Um, I'm currently the Technology and Metadata Services Manager at the Helen Plum Library in Lombard, Illinois. I joined the Rails Board in 2000, so this is the beginning of my third year. Juanita, would you like to go? Yes, I'm Juanita Harrell. I am currently the manager of the DuPage County Law Library at the uh, courthouse in Wheaton, Illinois. Um, what's a fun fact, this is my first term on the board and fun fact is I was also a public librarian at Oak Park Public Library. I've been teen services law, uh, librarian, health and wellness, and I worked with, once upon a time, worked with Dee and Monica. And I'm looking forward to, uh, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to uh, being on the board. And Rosie? Yes, my name is Rosie Camargo. I work at the Niles Main District Library. You may have heard of it. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have an LTA. I work in youth services. I am the Spanish language specialist and the multicultural coordinator for programs. Um, I'm on the Reaching Forward Conference Planning Committee. Um, and my focus is multicultural programming and uh, BIPOC representation. So I'm. this is my first year uh, on the Rails board. I started during COVID, uh, I joined the Rails EDI committee, which was such a wonderful experience um, and continues to be. I'm able to bring information to our um, EDI committee at the library and really focus um, my views and um, my workshops that I provide. Um, if you ever need anything, I am there for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is uh, see, I don't see Becky here. And uh, so Becky Spratford and Jennifer McIntosh are not here uh, for the orientation. Although I, I think Becky's coming in a little bit later, so, but you'll, you'll certainly meet them um, at lunchtime. So um, anyway, that was kind of thrilling. <laughs> So much diverse experience, yeah. and uh, you know that that people are bringing to the board. It's wonderful. So, uh, thank you for um, thank you for all of that. I really look forward to all the great things you're going to do for Rails when I'm not here anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so, all right. So, <laughs> yeah, so true. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Didn't re register to like three seconds after you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess I'll keep going. Yes. Is that good? Yes. Um, so, um, uh, you know, as, uh, as Beth noted, um, the first year can be, over, there's a lot to learn, potent, you know, for, for some of you anyway. Um, uh, we try to, uh, the reason we do the orientation is so that the year isn't so overwhelming in terms of things that you're, that you don't know or, or, because we're not a library, you know, we're, we, we're quite different from a library in many ways, as you will learn today. Um, but then, you know, we don't want the orientation to be so overwhelming either. So, um, but we do have this PowerPoint that we're going to go through. And I just, I want to just, you know, warn you, it, it is at a pretty high level. Um, because that's just, there, there's, you know, how much can you absorb? And, and, and we do spend, at every board meeting, we have a report on a service, we have a, you know, a board development topic, so that um, you'll learn a lot and you'll, um, you know, you'll learn a lot more as we go through the year about different services. And of course, we're happy to talk to you about anything at any point as well. So um, there's also you, you got a you, everybody should have a folder, um, like this, like this. And um, as we go through the PowerPoint, I will refer to some of the things that are in the folder. So it'll, I hope it doesn't confuse you. We will go through the folder, especially for some of the more very pertinent um, items that are in there when um, after we do the general PowerPoint. Does that make sense so far? And the PowerPoint is arranged as, you know, we start out with some background on the, on the system. And then we go into more, uh, you know, they say sort of high level detail, which is kind of a, a contradiction in terms, but nevertheless, um, of, uh, our, of our different services. And they're all arranged by our strategic plan goal so that you can see how things fit in, you know, why we do some of the projects that we do if it's not immediately clear, um, that should be, that should be helpful. Okay. So, and then after we do this, we will uh, have a break. Okay, so Karen, you're going to run the PowerPoint, right? And there we go. So, as I said, this is the orientation. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions as we go along, but we'll also have time for questions at the end. So, um, okay. So, Next slide, Karen. So this is the Illinois library system history, very briefly. Um, as you've already heard from s several people here, we are a, uh, a product of a merger of many systems. Uh, in uh, 2011, uh, five uh, predecessor systems merged to make rails. Uh, 1966, 67 was when the state, um, the legislature actually enacted uh, the Library System Act. It's, um, uh, we were one of the very first states to actually have, you know, really promote um, uh, resource sharing and library cooperation. So, um, yeah, I think we can move on from that. Go ahead. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so this is the from the text of the of the system act, and this is the main job of the system uh, to encourage the improvement. It says free public libraries there because uh, uh, partially because the system worked, did begin as public library only systems, and then transformed into multi-type, but um, also uh, the reason that public libraries are called out is because one of another one of the main things that that we are charged to do is to uh, uh, promote universal service to do what we can to expand uh, public library service in Illinois and we we take that very seriously as you 
probably know from some of the work we have undertaken um, legislatively. Next, Karen. So this is the map of this. This shows rails in Heartland. Um, you'll see that Heartland looks a little bigger geographically, and it is. Uh, but we have a lot more people. Um, and that is, uh, as, you'll, as you'll hear in a bit, that is why we have um, so much more money. Um, I think that rails is, and Heartland as well, um, but us in particular, because of how many, uh, uh, how many people live in our service area, and it is about 22,000 square miles geographically, um, we are one of the largest systems in the country. Go ahead. So this is a breakdown of our members by type. Uh, it, when we, it, uh, the total number of members has decreased a bit, probably at least I would say a hundred libraries fewer than there were at one point. Um, mostly have seen drops in specialized and school libraries, unfortunately. Um, some academics as well. I don't think we've, I think we might've added one public library since we started. Okay. Dave, may I ask a question? Why, yeah. why would a school library be dropped as a member or why would they no longer be a member? Uh, they can't meet the, the certification criteria. They close their, you know, they don't, they, yeah. I mean, and not, not all school libraries are our members, just, I mean, uh, you know, all public libraries are members. Um, we've added some schools over the, we just added, the, you probably, you may remember in some of our recent meetings, we added some school libraries, but yeah, if, when they, if they can't, if they're not, if they're not staffed, if they don't have paid staff, they can't be a member. Okay. That's a basic criteria. We are. We're, we're not. No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to do a little, you know, pie chart uh, showing the relative size. Um, public libraries may not be the biggest chunk, but they're definitely the most vociferous. <laughs> um, they um, they really uh, uh, participate and are very engaged with Rails. Um, and um, you know, we're, we want everybody to be as vociferous as they are and that you'll, you'll hear, that's one of the things we're gonna be working on this coming year. Okay. Okay, so this is a little bit about you, uh, 15 member board. Um, as you can see there, um, eight seats for public library trustees. That is, that is in the law that the majority of the board has to be uh, made up of public library trustees. Um, I thought in my, in my blissful ignorance that that could be changed and we could have more school libraries or more, you know, fewer trustees. Not, I love trustees. We all love, for, you know, to try to equalize it a little bit, but it's because of the way it even, even goes back before the law. It's the way that systems are funded. It's based on, the, you know, on, on, on residents. And so that, you know, that's directly related to public library trustees and public libraries. So there's nothing really that we can do about that. I don't even think changing the constitution would help. So, um, so that's why uh, there are so many, but there's, you know, I think there's a misconception that you have to be a library director to be um, on the rails board. And we're, ve we're very glad that that seems to be not so much anymore because we have a number of, of people who, even if they work in a public library um, and general, as you can see, there are four at large seats. That's generally where we get uh, the public library, uh, obviously, because unless you're both, <laughs> sometimes people are both, you know, trustee and public library. Anyway, that's the way it's made up. Then moving on to your little your duties, and we'll talk more about this when we go through the folder later on. But uh, generally, we we don't meet in December. 
Um, we encourage all of you to be on, uh, you know, one or more committees if you want. Obviously, your main job is fiduciary to monitor the finances, uh, establish, a, you know, approve policies. You have one employee that is me. Um, we'll talk more about ambassadors for Rails later um, as well. Um, obviously, expect you to, you know, do the uh, OMA training and. Uh, you know, file the, um, the statement of interest. Um, but just to be, you know, generally uh, as, you know, familiar with uh, our the system laws and library law in general as you can be, and we'll obviously help you with that. So these are uh, some of our committees, the advocacy committee, consortia committee, <coughs> uh, executive committee, um, the board president appoints um, uh, board members to these committees and appoints the committee chairs. And that's in process at this point. I think there's another page, right? Of committee, yep. So, um, right. So um, we'll talk more about that in the actual, in the meeting later on. And there's, there's more that I think we have more information about the committees in the folder as well. So this is the part about ambassadors. Uh, so we've, we've, uh, we've tried a lot of different ways with the, with suggestion, many suggestions input from board members about uh, about uh, talking points and giving you information that you can take back to your local boards or your colleagues. Um, that's and we call it ambassadors, but really it's about uh, you know being you know knowledgeable about rails and being able to you know speak about it if somebody asks you about it um, at a conference or in a library and to you know talk about rails at your at your board meetings. Um, you know rails is here to support libraries. And so we want libraries to know about what it is that we do for them. And you can be very helpful in that regard. So that's why we ask you to be um, ambassadors. And we give you, and you will see, you'll see later in the meeting this afternoon that there are, uh, we give you these uh, talking points in our monthly report that, with that megaphone attached to them so you can find them easily. And I'm going to, uh, now we're going to start, you know, taking turns a little bit so you don't have to just listen to me. And, and I apologize if I'm too, if I'm too, uh, you know, if my voice is not loud enough, you just have to wave at me if that happens. So, but I'm turning to Monica. She doesn't have any problem with <laughs> her voice. So. <laughs> Big compliment. <laughs> yes, exactly. Loud person. Yes, <laughs> So hello all, my name is Monica Harris. I'm the Associate Executive Director here at Rails. Uh, I've been at Rails since January of 2020, so right before the pandemic got started. Um, previous to that, I've spent about 20 years in public libraries. So that includes six years at the Schomburg Township District Library, where I was Assistant Director and then the Executive Director, and then seven years at the Oak Park Public Library, uh, where I came to Illinois in 2007. Uh, previous to that, my library career started in Michigan, where I worked in small and rural libraries. Um, so I'm pleased to be here today. Nice to meet all of you. Um, what we're talking about right now is Rails staff. So you can see Rails has 94 employees, um, and that is broken up in the way that you see down below. So that's 37 administrative staff who are primarily all based out of this Burridge building that you're in today. Uh, in addition to that, we also have 45 delivery staff. And uh, in a bit, we're going to go through all of our locations where that, those delivery staff are housed, uh, as well as 12 RSA staff that are all under this Rails staff umbrella. Um, RSA current, stands for um, RSA, it, the, the resource sharing, resource alliance? sharing alliance is the, the consortia LSAT. Um, and the current open positions that we have in Rails right now are the Coal Valley DSM position, um, our consortial services supervisor, uh, and our digital communications specialist position, which we'll talk about later in the board meeting this afternoon. Um, but with that, I'm going to pass you over to Mark Hatch, who's going to tell you a little bit more about our locations. Hi, good morning. Uh, the uh, Burridge Service Center is a 20,000 square foot uh, facility uh, that we use primarily, as Monica mentioned earlier, for our administrative uh, headquarters here. Uh, as she also mentioned, we have 37 uh, 
uh, individuals staffed here. Uh, that's almost half our staff. This is also the primary location for the board meetings, you know, uh, and that's also one of the two buildings that we own. The Baltimore Service Center uh, is located at 1000 Crossroads uh, Parkway. Uh, it's one of our largest uh, uh, delivery facilities. Uh, it's a great facility. It's a little over uh, 11,000 square feet. Uh, we have uh, 23 delivery staff uh, members there, uh, uh, seven Prairie Cats uh, team members there. Uh, we've got uh, 7,000 square feet or two thirds of the building is used to primarily process uh, a lot of the Carly, uh, Prairie Cat and Swan consortiums. Cole Valley, okay. Cole Valley, that's located at uh, uh, 220 West 23rd Avenue. Uh, it's the second building that we own. Uh, it's also one of our smallest hub. We only have uh, four delivery staff and uh, five delivery, uh, five Prairie Cat uh, team members there. Uh, this facility is also very unique, uniquely designed uh, and difficult to see from the streets. So uh, the library is primarily served out of this location is, is primarily Prairie Cat. Uh, the Prairie Cat Consortium is primarily serviced out of uh, this facility here. Peoria is another rental property. Uh, it's lo located at uh, 715 uh, Sabrina Drive. Uh, it's also the latest and the greatest uh, facility that we just opened in 2021. Uh, I think we did it in record time, uh, moving and uh, creating uh, this particular facility. Uh, we have uh, a little over 10,000 square feet. Uh, 6,600 of that is utilized to process our deliveries. Uh, all of our processing, uh, uh, which is primarily the RSA consortium out of this building here. <coughs> okay, this is our last service center, which is also a rental property. This is located at 4607 uh, Cope Road uh, in Rockford. Uh, we have six delivery staff uh, members uh, stationed here, and the location of the uh, consortium that is primarily service out of this is. So uh, back to me now, just a, a, a general overview of, of, of our funding. Um, and then Sharon Swanson is going to talk to us about um, more, a few more specifics about our budget in a little bit. And then um, as we go through the year, we'll try to provide more insight into our you know, various um, accounts and, and uh, uh, you know, things, the, uh, all of our fiduciary matters. So we are funded by an annual grant from the Illinois State Library through the Secretary of State's office. Secretary of State is officially the state librarian. Uh, we um, spend, we, we deal a lot with the, the director of the state library, Greg McCormick. He is sort of our official liaison and colleague, wonderful colleague, and you will be hearing from him at um, the board meeting th this afternoon. Uh, so we're, uh, it is, uh, a, as I said, officially a, a grant that we get. We have to apply for it every year. Quite a, a voluminous uh, uh, a grant uh, pro a project that we uh, grant, uh, that we have to submit. It is not a competitive grant in the sense that there's, you know, somebody else could get the rails funding to, to be a system, but it nevertheless, uh, there's a lot of uh, information that we have to provide to the, the state library about what we're going to do with the money that they give us. Uh, it is an area and per capita grant, which means that it's based on geography and population. And that is why uh, our funding is so much more than the Heartland Library System. Our funding now with the increase, which we got the first increase in well over 25 years, our funding this year went from almost 10 million up to 11.9 million. So quite a big increase. Um, the Chicago Public Library is also its own system. Um, we are all in the, uh, we, Heartland and uh, CPL are all in the same 
line item of the state budget. Um, and so if the if funding goes up overall, we all get a piece of it based on this area and per capita uh, calculation. Zoom type. Um, so as I said, our funding is about 11.9 million uh, and Heartlands is about five. I don't even think it is five. So that, that you know, there's a lot fewer, um, you know, services that they could provide because of that. But on the other hand, they have many fewer people. Right, 11.9 million. Um, we also do get um, LSTA funds uh, that, uh, that supplement the, um, our state grant and, uh, the, these are intermixed to, to fund all of our services. So as I said, um, we do have to submit an annual area per capita grant. Uh, the board um, uh, spends a couple of meetings in the spring looking at the at the at our proposed uh, uh, plan of service as well as at the budget and. Uh, it's based on the on the priorities of the Illinois State Library, of course, and also on our strategic plan, which, no surprise, are very closely aligned with each other. That's how it should be. Um, bless you. So I think now we're going to turn it over to Sharon to talk about. Mentioned and you're going to have to really speak up though. I'm very soft spoken, so I will step up to the table for this. Thank you. you hear me better. Yep. And if you can't hear me online, just scream out, please. Okay. So, as Dee mentioned, um, we are, we do uh, put together an annual budget every year as a part of our area per capita grant application. <coughs> Uh, we build the budget from the ground up using zero based budgeting so we don't simply increase the line items from the prior year by a percentage we do it in a very detail oriented way and build it from the ground up. Um, Rails is an intergovernmental entity uh, that is established by statute as Dee mentioned. We have approximately $29 million in net assets net assets meaning total assets minus total liabilities, we have very few liabilities and uh, no debt whatsoever. Our pension is over 100% funded. Uh, we're in a very we're in very sound financial shape with 20.8 months of unassigned cash and reserve. Um, we have $15 million in revenues, and as Dee mentioned, almost 11.9 million of which is from our area per capita grant, uh, which is our major source of funding. Um, a portion of our area per capita grant comes from federal funds, which Dee mentioned, <laughs> which necessitates our having to have an annual single audit in addition to our annual financial audit. Uh, next and I don't know why they call it the single audit because it's it's what it means. It's it's because it's it's federal it's federal money, so we have to have a special audit because of that. Yes. Anyway. Uh, our major uh, revenue categories include our uh, state grants, namely our area per capita grants. Um, last fiscal year, we also received a grant from FEMA for costs related to the pandemic, uh, costs for cleaning our facilities, so various supplies. Um, we also received unbudgeted um, grant funds related to the continued development of L2 and the specialized cataloging program. Um, and we are um, expecting both of those. The specialized cataloging grant um, is extended into this next fiscal year and we uh, just a couple of days ago were approved for our l2 grant for this next fiscal year so those will continue these um both of those grants are unbudgeted um, due to the grants remaining unapproved at the time that the budget was submitted um our uh, other revenue categories include fees for services and materials these are mostly um, related to um, our ilds contract as well as our e-read illinois membership fees uh, okay, and just um, as a note, there are no membership fees to belong to Rails, even though fees for services and materials sounds like there's a membership fee. Um, reimbursements are related to group purchases. Um, Rails is, um, Rails is um, extensive group purchasing program. 
Uh, these are completely offset by expenses down below, so they have zero net effect. Um, and these are budgeted to be approximately 2.1 million um, for this next fiscal year. Well, the fiscal year that we're currently in, fiscal year 23, which is an $800,000 increase from last year due to the growth of the program, which is fantastic, but especially the, grow the growth of the EBSCO group purchase in particular. Me too. I, I, I'm part of that. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Just joined <laughs> that one. And uh, lastly, investment income. Um, which of course we all know has greatly improved over the second half of the last fiscal year um, due to all of the record-breaking um, increases in rates implemented by the Federal Reserve. 0.75%, um, uh, they're expected to raise it again at this month's meeting, which is record-breaking since 1993, I believe 1994, 1993 increases. Um, and we've also uh, implemented a series of laddered investments that are meant to stabilize our investment income over the longer term, um, which you will hear much more about when we get into the board meeting. Um, so next slide. So as with most organizations and especially governmental organizations um, in particular, uh, personnel and personnel related costs account for um, the largest portion of expenses. Um, and these are budgeted to be roughly 44% of general fund expenditures. We are a service-based organization, so that is our largest expenditure. Um, contractual services, uh, the majority of which um, are made up of expenditures related to the partial outsourcing of um, our delivery services to, um, to, to our vendor, as well as the financial support for the local library system automation programs, the LSAPs, meaning Swan, Prairie Cat, RSA, Pinnacle, Rock River Library Consortium, and CCS. And these expenditures are budgeted to be roughly 22% of the general fund expenditures. And with that, I will hand it over to Monica to, to talk about our strategic plan. So is, is this a good time to throw in questions along yeah, the way? Or yeah. should you? Okay, I just Absolutely. had a question about the reserves. Um, yes. is, is that, so 28 months of of um, expenditures or yes, twenty point eight months. Oh, twenty point eight. Okay, mm -hmm. is that is that a goal? Is like does Rails have like a we we would like to have an emergency fund of X or does that just kind of keep growing as time goes on? It keeps growing as time has gone on. We've talked sometimes about, it goes down. Yes. <laughs> okay. As we saw with the budget stalemate several years ago. Okay. So yes, it's, it's Describe as well. what, oh, because, because the state didn't approve. So you, okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yes, and we lost a certain percentage of our earned per capita grant revenues during that time. Time. So. Okay, all right. So it is it is very good to have that much in in reserves. Yes. It's, it's, just, um, it's just a fact that we, you know, uh, it's like a, just to sort of, you know, to, to give context to the money in some ways, you know, because there was a time when we were, there were, you know, some of our colleagues were like, well, we don't know why you have $20 million in the bank. Well, the reason that we have $20 million in the bank is that is because we may not, we don't know when we're going to get money. I mean, we had a cash flow problem in that the state was not sending you know the the um, the the, the uh, area per capita money. It, it you know for in some in some years we didn't get it until like the end of the next fiscal year. You know so we were constantly playing catch up. Then there were two years when we only got sixty six percent of our money, and we didn't have we didn't cut any services because the board at that point decided it was a hopefully very unusual circumstance, and so they weren't going to you know. Oh, they weren't going to be too reactive. They were waiting to see. And we spent a lot of reserves at that point, okay. so-called reserves. Um, and uh, now the state is in much better financial um, shape. They're paying their they're paying bills on time and they're paying us very much on time. But it it can change at any moment. And so we that's just some that's a piece of information that we provide to ourselves. And to everybody, just so that you know that if we don't get any more money, this is how long we can last. Yeah. And I mean, it's never come to that, but you have to be aware that it could. And not to think, oh, you can just keep all that money in the bank and keep going, and it just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, out. I'm, I'm definitely in favor of emergency. I just didn't know if, if yeah, no, I, if there was a certain target that Rails was going for, or if it just kind of 
you know, as you said, ebbs and flows depending on whether right. you're, you know, you're being funded well or, or lapsed. I think the target is to live within our income. Okay. So our annual budget does, should not exceed our annual revenue. Yeah. Our, um, at one point when we uh, lost the, um, we received only 66% of our funding, as Steve pointed out. I believe we were down, if memory serves me right, to 12 months of coverage. Yeah. It did, the, it did really yeah, add to that. So. Yes. I think at one point the board did set a, you know, they wanted 18 months. Um, I think that's somewhere, you know, in policy, but, you know, if it doesn't happen, it, we don't have a lot of control over that ultimately. And this is the second year in a row that we've received all <laughs> area and per capita grant funds related to um, the fiscal year in question within the fiscal year by May, actually. Yeah. So we've yeah. been doing good lately. Right. But not always. Yeah, no, so it's in school libraries, same thing. You know, you apply for the per capita right. grant and you're like, I don't know if we got it. You just have to go on with life because, yeah. you know, maybe it'll show up someday. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the background. One other question thank you. as well. Yes, um, yes Beth. So I'm in Prairie Cat, and around the time that that state uh, impasse happened, we were in the process of trying to um, become independent of rails. And so I'm just wondering about how then, there's got to be money that goes to the, um, to the LSAPs. So is it similar? Do they apply for a grant as well? Yes, they ap apply for a grant from, a grant from us. Yes. Right. Okay. And what is that one called? LSAP support grant. You'll hear about that a little bit later from Ann Slaughter. Okay. That's a big. That's a big chunk. A chunk of our budget. It's the twenty-two percent that we spend on the LSAPs. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Yes. Excellent question. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. We want to share a little with you about our new strategic plans. We do have a new strategic plan this year as of 2022 that runs through 2025. Um, the board was very involved with our strategic planning process as well as members, but that process took place from June 2021 through January 2022 when the Rails Board approved the plan on January 28th. Um, we worked with a consultant called Constructive Disruption, um, and what we really wanted to do was to build on our last strategic plan goals and specifically ask for a lot of staff and member input uh, when it came to the shaping of the goals and the measurements of success. And so what you will see here in terms of what ultimately became the strategic plan, the mission statement, and the vision statement really, really came from our members. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, this is our mission statement. Um, and of course, a mission statement is why an organization does what it does. Uh, so ours is we connect libraries. Uh, Julie has on our real shirt today, and you can see that it's right on the back. Thank you, Julie. Um, <laughs> One of the things that came up through the course of our mission statement piece is that it should be very clear, help all of our members and our staff to understand what it is that we should do. And ultimately, if possible, it should fit on a t-shirt. <laughs> so, but, uh, and that's because it's a guiding purpose for exactly what we do and it can help everybody understand why Rails does what it does. So Rails is really in many ways, you know, pri its primary goal is resource sharing. And that connection is a big part of that. Um, it's about how we bring all of our libraries together to help them to learn and to be better together. Um, so let's go to the next slide, uh, which shares for us our vision statement. Um, and so the difference between a mission statement and a vision statement, of course, for those of you who work on this, is that the vision statement describes what an organization desires to achieve in the long run. So it's looking forward five or 10 or maybe even more years in terms of what you ultimately want to be able to provide. And it really makes your strategic uh, direction move in that way. So our vision statement, um, and these were both uh, you know, moved forward by the steering committee of the, the strategic planning committee, but also by the board. The We Connect Libraries mission statement was actually uh, suggested by the board during one of our meetings for the strategic plan. Um, but so our vision statement is thriving libraries are essential to all who learn, live, or work in Illinois. So really making sure that our libraries have what they need to thrive and then also to support the communities that they serve. Um, so we are going to organize a lot of the rail services, and we can go to the next slide, Karen, um, just in terms of what our strategic plan goals are. So we have 
four main goals. Um, and so what we'll share with you right now is our first goal. And as we said, our first goal is really related to resource sharing because it's such an important part of what Rails does. Um, so Rails provides leadership in ensuring sustainable, equitable resource sharing for all of our member libraries. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass us on to Dan Bostrom, who's going to talk a little bit about networking. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Bostrom. I'm the Rails Member Engagement Manager. Uh, so networking, um, you know, because of our size, we try to ensure that uh, Rails operates very much as a community. Uh, I like to call it Rails as platform. Uh, again, connecting libraries, as Monica talked about. So we regularly host online networking uh, events uh, on topics related to library service. Uh, we haven't hosted as many in-person uh, networking opportunities uh, over the past few years, but uh, we do work with with a lot of different groups. Uh, we partner with a lot of different groups. Uh, we host 45 different email lists, uh, including those relevant to type, job, and region. Uh, and you can subscribe, all of you can subscribe to pretty much any one of those. Um, we, we also work with over 90 different networking groups. And these groups, uh, they, they operate independently, uh, but uh, and sometimes they meet monthly, quarterly, even twice a year. Um, we support them through things like Zoom licenses, email lists, uh, you know, uh, opportunities to publish their events and to, and to get it open to a wider audience. Uh, Rails is a big audience, so you have the opportunity to really get your uh, events and, um, and uh, you know, uh, resources in front of people. I would invite all of you as board members to, to be involved in online networking. You can be inv involved in the Rails sponsored events. You can be in involved in some of these uh, other events. I'm sure some of you already, already, already are involved in uh, networking groups that operate in Rails. Um, and, and again, sign up for those email lists. Those are a great place to find out what is happening very much on the ground level of libraries. Uh, I, I would definitely advise you all to, to, to uh, subscribe to those type specific email lists, public, academic, special, and school. You'll find out a lot of things uh, that you might not know about otherwise. Um, you can find out about those networking group uh, events on L2. Uh, make sure that uh, you are logging in, checking the calendar. You'll see a whole bunch of events on there. Uh, and that, again, that's a great place to find, uh, uh, to find what you're looking for. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Layla, who's going to tell you about group uh, purchases and discounts. Hi, I'm Layla Heath. I am the Director of Library Resources and Programs, and my area encompasses the Deals and Discounts Program and a few of the statewide programs that I'll talk about later. So the Deals and Discounts Program is available for all types of libraries, and um, the program is growing as um, um, Sharon mentioned earlier, uh, members are saving over a million dollars a year through the deals and discounts program, and, and this is a place where the economies of scale are really leveraged. It comes into play both um, when we negotiate pricing based on the potential that 3,900 libraries bring, um, but it's maintained through the participation, and, and by that I mean both actively participating in the deal and also the feedback that I get from members about products that are important to them and how they're performing um, once they're in the library. So for a complete list of available um, discounts and deals, you can visit uh, this railslibraries.info forward slash deals. And now I will pass it over to Mark, who is going to talk um, about delivery. Great, thank you. We're going to talk about the good stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, four times a year, we uh, we ask our member libraries to uh, assist us with determining our uh, overall delivery count. Uh, in FY uh, 2022, we counted. Uh, Almost uh, almost nine million items, eight point eight million items. Uh, uh, Fifty one percent of that was uh, actually uh, processed by our delivery vendor, Continental Transport Logistics or CTL, uh, it was located uh, in Elmhurst, Illinois. The remaining forty nine percent were processed by the uh, four rails uh, delivery hubs uh, in uh, Bolingbrook, uh, Cole Valley, East Peoria, and Rockford. And by the way, tours are available at any one of our facilities upon request. If you'd like to see one, one of our facilities, uh, you know, we can definitely arrange that. Uh, our fleet is uh, 38 vehicles. Uh, these are the delivery vehicles that we have. Uh, and that ranges from uh, uh, the F-450 box trucks to the 
Ford Transit, uh, and we also have a few of the E-Series vans that we're slowly phasing out. Uh, they're no longer supported by uh, Ford. Uh, as far as uh, uh, outsourcing, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we've uh, contracted uh, for uh, Continental uh, Transport Logistics, or CTL, to process 51%, uh, which is the legacy uh, uh, Burr Ridge and Wheeling service areas. Uh, they do a great job. We've had a relationship with them since uh, uh, 2015. We also utilize the postal service uh, for a lot of our deliveries. We have over 400 locations that are set up under, under mail, uh, primarily because either their volume is extremely small uh, or it just doesn't uh, uh, necessitate a physical delivery to the doorstep. Uh, majority of these libraries may only get four or five deliveries a year. So it makes sense to put them on a mail shift schedule versus a physical delivery uh, to those particular locations. Uh, as far as the, you see the number there of 138,663 bags, that is for Carly or the IODS. Uh, Carly is the Consortium of Academic Research Libraries of Illinois. Uh, we came into a service agreement with them, uh, I think in 2016, where we service in the Rails area 110 libraries. Uh, and this is done on a cost recovery basis. So we actually get $550,000 a year uh, in reimbursement for servicing uh, those, uh, those locations. Uh, we're always looking for ways to uh, save money, increase our efficiency. So we've been working quite a bit uh, with Geomark, which is the old laboratory of applied spatial analysis. Uh, they're located in uh, the Southern Illinois University in Eversville. Uh, we're also uh, moving toward a lot more automation. Uh, and what I'll do in, in September, uh, I'll be uh, discussing more in detail a lot of the things that we've, uh, uh, we've been working on and a lot of the automation that we've got uh, uh, in place so that it come at our topic of the month in September. Hey, um, hey, you're up, hi. Ann. Hi, everyone. My name is Ann Slaughter. I am the Director of Technology Services. Um, and in addition to working with the Rails um, IT department on our internal technology systems, um, my umbrella encompasses all the other things that I'm going to talk with uh, you all about today. Um, and the first thing is the work that we do with our LSAPs, um, which is a word that and an acronym that we're stuck with thanks to the uh, the Library Systems Act where it's spelled out. Um, it's a local library system automation program, um, term used here in Illinois, uh, which is basically a catalog consortium, uh, pluralist consortia, uh, otherwise known as a network in many other states. Um, but it's a group of libraries that shares catalog software. Um, and when online catalogs first became available, um, you know, a few decades ago, it was a major innovation in library service, obviously, and there was a huge effort to convert libraries from their card catalogs, and systems were heavily involved in that. They were urged to start these catalogs, um, which meant that most of the LSAPs as they are now have their origins as departments of the regional library systems, um, although some of them were formed independently of the systems. Um, and there is a long history of splits and mergers since then, um, in some ways tracking with the system mergers and in other ways not. Um, for example, when Rails was formed, there were 11 catalog consortia in our service area. Only four of them were uh, considered LSAPs. Now, thanks to several mergers, we have just the six shared catalogs within our service area, and all of them are LSAPs. Um, thanks to an expanded definition of LSAPs that was passed by the Rails Board in 2016. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So some of the benefits of LSAP membership to the member libraries is, um, you know, it's all about 
like Layla said, this is another place where libraries see a lot of economy, economies of scale. Um, so they're sharing the ILS software um, primarily, which is often very expensive and also labor intensive to manage. Um, and to that end, there's also that shared management of the software. Um, you know, someone is doing most of that lifting for the libraries, um, as well as the negotiating and buying power that that a group of libraries um, can have with their vendors. And of course, they're sharing their collections. All member libraries share most of their materials via their LSAPs, and they share them very actively with each other, meeting uh, most of their interlibrary loan needs uh, from within their consortium. Um, they are all very different from each other. Uh, some of their service offerings are more bare bones. It's pretty much only the uh, catalog. And then others offer more services, have more staff. Um, you know, so they, the larger groups might offer uh, services like centralized cataloging, more training for member library staff, um, and extensive consulting. So we can go to the next slide. So as you've already heard, um, we have, this is a list of our six shared catalog consortia that are uh, within the Rails uh, service area. Uh, CCS, Pinnacle, Prairie Cat, Rock River, RSA, and SWAN. All together, uh, 410 agencies participate. Those agencies represent 523 individual buildings. Um, and the size of, of each group um, ranges from six libraries to about 150 libraries, depending on the group. Um, so this is about 38% of Rails libraries belonging to a catalog consortium, uh, which means the rest of the libraries are standalone. Um, so they either maintain their own catalog software, and a small number of our libraries are not automated and do not currently have a library catalog. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more later about what we hope to do about that. Um, so most of that 38% of libraries are in one of the LSAPs. And then about uh, about 70 are in Carly um, that are their academic libraries and they are part of Carly's uh, catalog consortium called iShare that is statewide um, and supported by the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Um, so the member libraries are primarily public libraries, but they do also include academic school and special libraries. Uh, not every LSAP has multi-type membership, but they are all open to multi-type membership, which is a requirement um, of one of the criteria for being an LSAP. Um, and, you know, they are all critical partners for Rails. We do a lot of work with them. Um, they, of course, do a ton of resource sharing and engage with so many of our members. So we, you know, because we share all of these members with them. So we do a lot of work together. Um, we can go to the next slide. And uh, here is our support for these consortia, um, like you were asking about earlier, Beth. Uh, so we provide support to each one of the six LSAPs. Um, our support is a mix of financial support and some in-kind services, and that's depending on the group. And over the years, we've transitioned um, away from, you know, kind of that, the previous model of, of being mostly like operating the, the LSAP, the system operating the LSAP, providing in-kind support. We've transitioned to providing mostly financial support. Um, they are all independent organizations that are separate from Rails. Uh, one of them is a nonprofit. They're, most of them are intergovernmental instrumentalities. Um, so we have a grant program uh, called the LSAP Support Grant. Uh, we budget about $2.25 million each year. Uh, to be distributed to the LSAPs through that grant program. That's about um, you know, a little more than 20% of RAILS um, expenditures in a given year. Um, that support is allocated using a formula that, that we've developed and iterated on um, over the years. 
Um, and that is calculated as part of the grant making process. Um, so at this point in the timeline, the fiscal 24 application has just this week been distributed to the LSAPs um, and it's due on September 15th. Um, and we determine and award them their support levels by late October, which is ahead of the rails budgeting process. All of the consortia have, um, have earlier budgeting processes and, and kind of longer timelines for membership approval. Um, so we do commit those funds uh, before we make our own budget uh, and make sure that we let them know that, that our support is um, contingent on system funding. So some of these groups have always received system support um, and their operations depend on that support. And some of them have always been financially independent, um, you know, so they're new to receiving rail support and see it kind of as more of a bonus. They all uh, use our funding a little differently. They report on that every year um, and you will see those reports uh, in the August board packet. Um, so as Monica mentioned, the RSA staff are currently provided by rails. That is, you know, our, our most significant in kind support that we provide. And that's that is a legacy dating back to when LSAPs were departments of our of our predecessor systems. Um, they are now actively working towards reducing their reliance on rails operations. Um, and over the next couple of years, they will be moving towards employing their own staff and making other steps towards financial independence and, and kind of complete that transition to receiving financial awards from us um, rather than having their award be mostly staff. Um, we also have a catalog membership grant uh, that goes to libraries that helps to expand LSAT membership um, by offsetting many of the one-time costs that are associated with joining a consortium for a library that includes vendor service and, and in some cases the necessary technology. Uh, this program has been um, in effect since fiscal 15. Um, and over that time, we've made 71 awards. Uh, the total is about $1.75 million over all of those fiscal years. And that has gone to support 65 individual libraries in joining LSAPs and then three group migrations, um, some of those mergers that I referred to. Uh, and we also provide specialized cataloging services. Uh, that is, um, most of that is training, although I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, um, about the rest of it later, um, focusing on basic training, which is a, a huge need across our service area. It's recurring and it's in very high demand. Um, it is open to all Rails libraries, uh, consortium members and standalone libraries and our cataloging uh, services coordinator, Nancy George, um, who is wonderful. Um, she often works directly with LSAPs to coordinate services and enhance their own member experiences. Um, and she also does a lot of consulting with our member libraries and um, actively participates in all of the networking groups in our service area. Uh, next slide. So finally, um, we have Finemore, Illinois, um, which is a separate service, um, but it is another service that's centered on interlibrary loan. Um, it is a software platform called ShareIt that um, facilitates interlibrary loans by connecting multiple library catalogs. Um, it allows patron-initiated requests via the web. Um, there, the web interface just you know, looks like an online library catalog and functions in much the same way. Um, and then there's a staff interface for managing requests. And um, a huge benefit of this program is that you know, it doesn't replace consortia. It's fundamentally different than a, than a shared catalog, but it interconnects um, consortia and standalone libraries. And we found that, uh, that membership is, is um, incredibly beneficial to standalone libraries that are interested in easily participating in resource sharing, but maintaining their own catalog software, um, as well as members of, of some of the smaller consortia. Um, we have all six libraries in Pinnacle currently in the process of joining. Um, 
right now their training is is underway. Um, so it's an additional resource for interlibrary loan for our libraries. Um, for some, it can be an alternative to OCLC. Um, there is the ability to download um, uh, catalog records for local use um, and is an expansion of resource sharing that uh, is a statewide program. We don't currently have any members uh, participating from the Heartland service area, but it is open to them. Um, we currently have an incentive program in place. Libraries do pay an annual fee uh, to belong to Find More Illinois, but right now there are no one-time setup fees and no annual fees assessed to libraries until fiscal 24. Um, so you won't see much about that, uh, about Find More Illinois in our budget this year um, and our revenues, but but generally we do have uh, fee revenues. And we did grow to um, 50 and counting uh, this past year. We just had two additional libraries sign on this week. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Layla. Sorry, can you mean? Yes, hold on a second, Layla. Yes, sure. Monica. Right. Um, see, can I just ask a very blunt question? Because I truly don't know the answer. What What is the purpose, the status, the function, the role of OCLC in our state? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea what a learned question is. Well, and, and, and I think I kind of do because I sort of know a little of history, but. I, I, I feel like I feel like especially school librarians who are a little bit deer in the headlights just working on the kids who are in front of them all the time. This is unknown. Like I just truly don't know sure. where to stand. I'll just give you a short answer. Okay. This needs to be and is on the list of yeah. of of uh, of report topics okay. coming up soon Got it. At, at, at other meetings. Okay. But essentially Illinois is is in because of the state library, frankly, um, is Illinois libraries are kind of inextricably stuck with OCLC at this point. And I'm going to be very blunt because yeah. I'm not a fan of OCLC. Um, uh, I and OCLC is very expensive. We are the we are their biggest customer. The state of Illinois is their biggest customer in the world, wow. which is absurd. Um, I told you I was going to be blunt. Uh, we spend $5 million of, on it a year. Uh, the state library puts in about one point something and the rest of the money comes from all of us. Um, and it's and they they make us buy things that we don't need in order so that we can get things that we do think we can only get from them like cataloging and interlibrary loan. This can not be read, but um, yeah, find, find more. more can be a replacement for OCLC, and it and in some states it already is. And so that's one of our goals. Okay, is to is to get that money back, that five million dollars that's being spent on something that doesn't that it doesn't need to be spent on. Okay, and I mean I'm not saying that we wouldn't have any relationship with OCLC but for every almost every library in Illinois no matter its size to be a member of OCLC is absurd okay so that was that was my follow up there yeah. there's no there's no expectation requirement encouragement for rails members to be OCLC not from customers. rails okay no nope. it's just tradition yeah right and i know it was you know previous staff who kind of made it and for a while there it was a requirement to get the school per capita grant i know that's been changed well and and that was changed yeah but i think a lot of us were like okay i don't know i guess that's what you have to do and we just keep on doing it because we i think again truly not understanding right yeah okay yeah. all right so it's it's just another option does the state library still push it is it still yeah okay it's a big complicated yeah long story yes yeah. <laughs> which we we if should you want to talk about it more i once was once upon a time served on the illinois state libraries um resource sharing on the the committee that oversaw the renewal of the oclc yeah. contract and OCLC was basically allowed to 
dictate terms. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Okay. It's it's something that needs to be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess I always thought maybe from a school library point of view, and I have argued this out loud to fellow school librarians. And now, of course, I regret those words because I didn't. I mean, it was the argument was a couple years ago, but to say, no, you have to be a member of OCLC because that's, you know, like you're playing the game and you're being part of the group. And even if you don't intend to do interlibrary loan, like we want to have our information shared with OCLC because that's, you know, that's how you're a good library neighbor and things. Um, but, but not true. No. Okay. Not, you don't, it's, they used to be the only game in town. Now they're not. Yeah. So, okay. All right. Competition is good. Yep. Thank, thank, thank you for the background. Sure. Okay, Layla. All right. E Read Illinois. Um, this is Rails e content platform. Um, it is available to all libraries and it in um, Illinois, and it, it um, includes both ebooks and e audiobooks. The pricing is very reasonable, and those fees all go towards purchasing um, the uh, the titles for the collection. We have an e-content specialist, Anna Beam, and she provides support and training as well as uh, the weekly title selection. The important thing about this program too is that we focus on the popular titles. Um, this is a problem for our libraries. The, with the cost of ebooks, the, the holds uh, lines can get long quickly. And so we, we focus on the popular titles, keep those low um those low holds ratios and um it's it's really proved to be helpful and um has really uh th this program has gained a lot of traction we have nearly a thousand libraries that participate in this program currently um K, K through 12 public and some academics and specials this collection currently has over 64,000 titles for adults and children, um, and you can see the breakdown on the slide: over forty-five thousand ebooks and nearly twenty thousand e-audio books. Next slide, please. Inky.org is um, a program that Rail subsidizes for the entire state. Um, it's a suite of resources, and they enable uh, local authors or anybody to write. Um, using their online creation books, they can you can write an ebook and then publish it. Um, and in addition, the platform allows you to share that with a, any library in Illinois. Um, you also, if you have community collections, so some libraries, for instance, have collections of cookbooks or yearbooks, things like that. Those can also be shared on the Inky.org platform. Next resource or next slide, please. Um, our Explore More Illinois program is our online cultural pass program for Illinois public library card holders. Um, this was just implemented a couple years ago, right before the pandemic started. And um, currently, we have over 600 live public libraries that are participating across the state. It um, is, you can get, um, because it's online, it's available 24-7. And we have recently piloted our first community college, and we're in the process of selecting a second one after the success of the first one. So we hope that that will continue to expand. Um, next slide, please. I think that goes over to Monica again. Thank you, Layla. Um, so we're on to strategic plan goal two. Uh, and that goal is that Rails models best practices in equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, throughout the town hall process and the survey process, we heard loud and clear from members that this was a huge priority for them that they wanted to see from us in a next strategic plan cycle. So both the internal modeling, um, as well as providing best practice for how libraries who are within Rails can provide the best possible practices in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, one piece of note is that through that process, uh, members asked that we added accessibility to this piece because they also feel that this is a very important part of what they wanna be able to provide to their libraries and communities. Um, and so that was added to this goal. Um, so with that, I want to, add, uh, to pass it on to Joe who will tell you a little bit about some of the efforts happening at Rails. Thank you, Monica. Good morning, everybody. I'm Joe Filipek, Director of Consulting Continuing Education. Uh, I look forward to taking the 20 steps from my office to the meeting room later to get to see all of you, <laughs> many of you in person. Um, 
So you heard Deirdre earlier talk about um, talk about board committees and recognizing the need, uh, the, the really the priority we wanted to place in supporting our members around EDI, a board EDI committee was uh, established, I guess it would have been about two years ago um, to really advise and support rails and our member libraries in this area. Just like other board committees, we have not only board members uh, serving, but also rail staff who are uh, serving in an ex officio capacity, as well as staff from across our member libraries who are really passionate about this issue uh, wanting and want to contribute. Obviously, Rosie Camargo is an example of that uh, before she before she got on Rails board. Along the way, this committee was we created some subcommittees uh, to really focus on specific areas. Um, among them, you know, staff training, programming, outreach, etc. Uh, and the work of this committee, I, I would say, has led to some actionable outcomes, such as. Uh, a couple examples, some of the, the, the inspiration ideas for training that we could offer our membership has come out of that sub subcommittee, as well as uh, what we're doing now is really building a, a template for a directory that our membership will be able to use who are uh, both speaking uh, individuals who can, and organizations who can provide training and education around EDI topics as well as, as presenters even for public programming who uh, represent identities that, that really reflect the diverse communities that our libraries serve. Now we know, of course, that as a system, continuing education is, is really one of the more actionable steps that we can take to support our member libraries in this area. Uh, so in addition to training offered by Rails, and as I said, kind of inspired and recommended by our board subcommittee, um, we did award approximately $10,000 in the last year uh, to libraries and consortia um, through, uh, through our EDI event grants. Uh, libraries and consortia who sought to organize and execute EDI training that would be available to all Rails members. And again, last fiscal year, I think we had a total of 10 EDI focused events that were attended by over 1,200 Rails members. So looking ahead, we're going to be launching our uh, very first EDI learning cohort for our membership is something we've been talking about for a while and, and really wanted to do. So this will be a monthly online cohort primarily for up to 50 of our members. Uh, be, this will begin in October and run through May and it will engage participants primarily around the foundational frameworks, you might say, and, and critical concepts of EDI in a supporting learning environment. This will be uh, primarily led by Rails EDI consultant, Elizabeth uh, Lindsay Ryan. Uh, our applications are, period is open right now and will be for another week. Um, I will say that just, um, or just in, in reviewing the applications we've received so far for this cohort, I've been, been pleased by the fact that we are getting applications from library staff uh, not only from outside suburban Chicago, so really representative of our service area at large, but also those who are not necessarily in a management position, that it's really kind of a, a combination of management and professional staff, which was another thing that was really important to us. So we're really looking forward to that cohort launching this fall. Um, and then finally, it's worth mentioning that um, in our role as, as connector of libraries, we do have, and you heard Dan mention our listservs, we do have a listserv that's dedicated to EDI so that our members can connect to one another around this topic, sharing uh, best practices, sharing recommendations, et cetera. So if we move to the next slide, I'm gonna um, turn it back to Anne, who will say a few words about another service in this space related to cataloging. Yeah, so the other arm of the um, other major arm of the specialized cataloging services that I mentioned earlier is our World Language Cataloging Services Program. Um, this is a statewide program that is funded by a special grant from the Illinois State Library um, that provides cataloging for materials in world, uh, world languages, non-English languages that are um, in the library's regular collection as opposed to being a special collection. Uh, this directly supports our libraries with their uh, equity and inclusion efforts uh, by helping them 
serve their patrons in who are in previously underserved groups who have not had access to materials in their native languages. These materials, um, you know, if they're purchased by libraries, in many libraries, they, they might be processed more slowly um, if, they're, if their staff don't have skills in the, the non-English languages spoken in their communities. Uh, so we will take these materials or a, a surrogate and uh, provide cataloging records for them. Uh, Mincy does some of the cataloging in languages that she's an expert in, and then the rest is outsourced to a vendor. Uh, there's been a lot of member interest in this service. We just um, got it started in the previous fiscal year. Um, and it, I, you know, it was in response to a clear need that we'd identified through uh, surveys of our members, and it's growing quickly. And before I pass it back to Joe, I just wanna add a one bullet point to the uh, Find Tomorrow Illinois um, that is in addition to um, our, we have one person, Eric Bain, who works on Find More Illinois essentially full time um, and does a great job. But as the service has grown and, you know, we've added members and, and enhanced our services, uh, that workload has grown accordingly, which is the reason for the consortial super uh, services supervisor position that we currently have open. Um, that person will come in and help steer Find More Illinois, as well as an effort to automate um, our kind of remaining non-automated and under-automated libraries and get them connected into Find More Illinois as well. Um, so thank you for bearing with me on that. And I'm gonna pass it back to Joe. All right, thank you, Ann. Um, so we recognize that that Rails, um, when we talk about this area of our strategic plan, we recognize that Rails can't lead our members um, if we are not as an organization both informed around this topic, but also practice the things that we wish to, to demonstrate to our members. Um, that's how we want to be a leader for our members. So um, among the things we do myself, Deirdre and uh, eight other staff from across uh, the organization. And this includes uh, staff at our East Fury office, uh, part of RSA and also delivery staff and part of the Rails climate team who have been meeting monthly with our consultant, uh, Biz Lindsay Ryan to take a critical look at our organization and, and across our membership at issues related to, to EDI. Much of our time I would say up to this point has been to really look at our internal and external relationships and identify uh, challenges, opportunities, and really just generate ideas that, that we hope to create actionable projects in these areas. So just, we have about five or six right now that we're really trying to get off the ground. A couple examples, we're looking at a way to better evaluate um, the, the various partners and vendors that we work with and how we can evaluate that through an, an equity lens and an EDI lens and how to, how to really make that a, a, an intentional act. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, as we bring new staff on, how can we develop sort of a connections program so that we build really what we hope to be an inclusive working environment here at Rails. Uh, part of the work, of course, is to have also all of our staff uh, participate in training. So another role for our EDI consultant is, is to lead these trainings, which we've been coordinating twice a year. Obviously, they've been online over the past couple of years. And this includes not just staff here at Burr Ridge, but all of RSA staff, all of our delivery staff. Um, and the topic that we've explored thus far has been sort of the introductory, the foundational concepts around EDI. We've explored gender. We've explored various components of relationships. And of course, we'll continue with these trainings and exploring other topics in the EDI realm in the months ahead um, as we move into the fall and then again in the spring. And finally, another role for our consultant is as a resource when we are looking at our own policies and having someone um, with expertise to view our, our internal policies through that equity lens. I know that uh, Sam Daly in our HR department will be working on this in the months ahead as another part of the conversations that we have been having with the climate team, what we can do uh, internally. So if we go to the next slide, we've also had conversations during climate team about the board, about the makeup of the board. So I think I think Deirdre is going to say a few words about this. Yes, just that uh, 
one of the things we'll be doing working on this year is our board um, election process. Uh, I think we've done a uh, we've been working now intent intently uh, intentionally, I guess is a better word um, to diversify the board in many ways, uh, job title, uh, geography is always an issue, obviously ethnicity, you know, all the different things that go into you know diversity. Um, and you know, I think recruitment has definitely uh, improved, but I think that the way that our board is elected um, and that it's like a you know by type of seat, it's kind of like an open free for all. So um, you know there there might be there might be ways that we could do it, um, as I say, more um, intentionally so that we we have a better uh, a greater ability to have uh, a more representative board. You know, we've made a lot of progress, but I think we can we can make even more progress. And moving along, we go to the next goal. So we're on to strategic plan goal three, uh, and that is real to assist member libraries in preparing for the future. Um, our libraries are, of course, very concerned about what's coming down the road, and they want to be as prepared as they can be. And that can mean all kinds of things. Um, so we'll go ahead and move to the next slide to share a little bit about what um, that might be. So, you know, as Joe was on a little bit earlier and talked a little bit about some of the EDI based um, continuing education piece that is offered, there is, of course, a wide range of continuing education programming that's available through Rails um, that is provided by our wonderful CE team um, here at Rails. And in addition to that CE, we also provide consulting. Um, and so some of you, we don't talk about this a lot, um, but it's good to know that many of our libraries reach out to us to directly and specifically reach out to Joe Philippak directly um, to ask for help on issues that they don't know how to solve. Um, and we provide the guidance that we can. Um, that support really allows them to continue uh, to move forward with big questions that they have in addition to all of the other opportunities that we have for networking and asking each other and, and connecting colleagues. Um, it's, it's one additional service that Rails provides. Um, we also collaborate with partners on statewide advocacy efforts. Rails is part of many statewide groups, um, including uh, having Jeter Brennan on as an ex officio on the ILA Public Policy Committee, um, where there is a lot moving forward in terms of the ways that Rails can help to support and advocate for uh, legislation and other advocacy opportunities that can help to benefit everybody in Illinois. Um, and then we received actually a lot of requests through our strategic planning process uh, that we developed videos and other resources to help libraries of all types demonstrate the need for continued uh, and additional funding. Uh, this is also related to the digital communication specialist position um, that again, you'll see this afternoon uh, that will be offered at Rails, but our hope is that we can get somebody on board who has real expertise in being able to create robust uh, digital tools that can help our libraries to promote themselves and tell their stories. Um, so that's another part of what Rails wants to be able to provide. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dan Bostrom, who will tell you a little bit about My Library Is. Hi, thank you, Monica. Yeah, so, so to introduce My Library Is, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, our, our previous strategic plan uh, in, in developing that, we did a listening tour where uh, members of the rail staff went around uh, our region to kind of listen to libraries and hear what they were looking for. And one of the things that we heard very loud and clearly is that libraries needed help telling their story, needed resources and tools uh, to talk about funding, advocacy, marketing, all those things. So as part, uh, back in probably 2019, uh, we, we launched the My Library Is campaign and it's really grown uh, pretty much beyond uh, what we could have even imagined. Uh, there's a website, mylibraryis.org. I hope you all become familiar with it. Uh, on there, we have videos, blog posts, uh, talking points. Uh, we've developed a ton of great resources on there. Um, working with uh, Joe and the CE team, uh, we've been uh, we've offered professional development uh, for our members around these topics, around marketing, advocacy, um, uh, graphic design, things like that. Um, we also have an advisory group of, of folks, a, a group of volunteers who regularly write blog posts. They work on special projects. They help us keep the campaign moving forward and at ever adapting as, it, as the situation calls for it. Um, 
one of the other things that we do as part of this campaign is we give away grants. Uh, we've given away uh, grants to both uh, to all types of libraries, but uh, in the last two years, we've really focused on school libraries. And we just awarded, actually back in June, we awarded $78,000 in grants to school libraries to help tell their story. Uh, a lot of great projects, a lot of really innovative, cool stuff that uh, school libraries are working on. So um, as part of that, uh, I guess I'm at, at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Monica uh, to talk a little bit more about how Rails is advocating for school libraries. Thank you, Dan. And, and so as Dan said, those My Library Is grants have been a huge part of how Rails has supported school libraries. But as Monica and Beth would tell you, school libraries really need Rails support and help right now, maybe more than ever. Um, and so Rails has been part of some really significant efforts to try to increase their understanding and support, especially for school libraries. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is this partnership that we have with IELT, which we now refer to as the IELT partnership. Um, those meetings began as a regular kind of monthly partnership meeting between between Rails, uh, the Illinois Heartland Library System, and IELT, beginning in sort of late 2019, early 2020, um, but have grown over time to be a regular every single month meeting that now includes IELT, uh, Chicago Public Schools, Heartland, of course, um, the Illinois Library Association, and the Illinois State Library. So all of those folks are on a call once a month just to talk about school libraries and the things that school libraries need. Um, this partnership has really resulted in some really strong collaboration and continuing education programs that have been developed and shared. Um, shared advocacy efforts, especially around the materials challenges issue, which I'm sure all of you are very aware is a huge issue in both public libraries and school libraries. Um, and most recently with the school data project. Um, I'm just going to, you know, point out Jeanette and Grant. Grant's going to speak to you a little later in the presentation, who have really led uh, the support of this school data project. So Rails was approached by a national researcher named Keith Curry Lance in January of 2021, um, and specifically about the lack of national data about school libraries, but specifically about the lack of data that came from Illinois. It was something like almost half of the missing data in what he was looking at came from Illinois because yeah. of the reporting uh, that was in place. So um, under Dee's leadership uh, and, and in working with the IELTS partnership and understanding what a complicated issue this is to solve, um, we moved forward uh, with the process of doing a school data project that could really dig in deep and try to figure out what was going on in school libraries in Illinois. Um, and that support came from uh, being able to hire on uh, Janet Duraki to really work on that and under Grant's leadership. Um, they report on their findings each month to the IELTS partnership. And they've, of course, also reported to the board um, and our advocacy committee to talk a little bit more about what they're finding. Um, but we are very hopeful that their work will make the picture of what the school library worker and school libraries in general uh, environment in Illinois is much more clear. Um, and of course, Jeanette uh, just recently joined us as a full-time data research specialist. And we're very delighted uh, to have Jeanette on board with us. And then I'm going to pass it back uh, to Joe, who will talk about professional development. Yeah, so over the last, I guess, eight years, the uh, CE consulting department has grown into a department of one to a department department of three, myself and my colleagues, uh, Diana Rush and Margie Schmidt. And I think libraries have really always traditionally thought of the, the regional library systems as an important source of, of continuing education. Um, and we know that for, for a lot of our members, they don't have as, as many options. And so the regional library systems, that role is, is really critical. So we are working to always organize a variety of CE events that are gonna help our member library staff ultimately be better at delivering services to their community. So much of the work our team does is to seek out and, and contract usually with different individuals and organ organizations to deliver that CE. And that is going to be some combination of those core library topics that we kind of always need to offer, but then also being responsive to an immediate need and also thinking about, of course, future focus, professional development. Obviously, the pandemic has given us plenty of opportunities to provide training that is uh, responsive. And as you see on the screen there, um, you know, 53 events in the last fiscal year, I think that kind of one per week average is something that we kind of try to strive for uh, each and every year. While we try to seek out CE that's going to be a value to members regardless of the library type that's going to speak to whether you're a school librarian, academic, et cetera, we also recognize that some of the CE that we offer really does have to be 
library type specific. So in the case of public libraries, there's always a lot of interest in the kind of legal HR realm that, that's always changing. And then, you know, as Monica said, partnering with IELTS for schools and some of the specific needs, such as right now, the materials challenges, those are just a couple different examples. Uh, we know that with so many part-time staff in libraries and all the varied schedules based on the kind of library type you might be, it's, it's really important that we have training that's available on demand. So we record as often as possible when we're doing training. We have around probably about 250 recordings now on the Rails CE archives, and that is always growing. I mentioned our event grants uh, previously talking about EDI, but we've, we've had these grants around since about 2015 to support libraries, consortia, and networking groups who wanted to organize uh, CE events but needed funding to make that happen. We've awarded around $125,000 since 2016. That funded uh, around 75 CE events, all of those being open to Rails members. And then, of course, we encourage all of you and, and trustees at large to attend uh, Rails Continuing Education events. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Karen, uh, we do work in collaboration with, with various partner organizations in Illinois to develop uh, library leaders in Illinois. Uh, two, in two initiatives I'll mention are just uh, Directors University and Elevate. So Directors University is an intensive week-long training for new public library directors around the state. Uh, this is held June Springfield. Last couple of years has been online, but we did return to the state library just this past June. Um, this is really modeled after what used to be the statewide public library management institute it was called and actually in just about a week and a half we'll be back in springfield for directors university 2.0 inviting back those who had gone through the first iteration of directors university uh, to explore topics in greater depth and also explore some new topics and then finally elevate is a broader leadership initiative that is open to library staff from all types of libraries uh, and each year has focused on a different aspect of leadership. Um, didn't offer it in 2022, hopeful to uh, offer it again in 2023 in the spring and hopefully in person again. It's the kind of event that uh, the sort of networking and small group discussion component is really, really critical. Uh, the next slide, Karen, we'll talk about trustee training. So Rails supports not only staff at our member libraries, but also the trustees who serve those libraries in their community. And one of the ways we do this is by offering trustees across the state access to, uh, among other things, Short Takes for Trustees, which is a United for Libraries uh, sort of product that are recorded on demand uh, webinars that cover a variety of, of trustee training topics. We also strive to schedule training for trustees at different times of the year, topics including you know, running how to run more effective board meetings, uh, basic parliamentary procedure, and things like Open Meetings Act training. Um, just you know, coming up in a couple months, we'll be having we'll be doing a couple webinars around topics how board and directors can can work better together and again, have more productive meetings. Uh, you heard Dan talk about online roundtables, and we've worked on a few specifically for trustees that we try to integrate some training into as well. And occasionally myself um, and even other staff at Rails will uh, attend board meetings and do training, uh, particularly for onboarding of, of new library trustees uh, and providing guidance in, in a certain area. And then written, it's worth mentioning too, written into our plan of service is the goal of uh, developing a, a more robust trustee training curriculum, if you will, that we hope to work with um, our partner organizations like Heartland, ILA, and the State Library to see developed in the year ahead. Uh, we just we all recognize that there's really a need and something of a void for this kind of training um, for trustees who play such a critical role. And then on the next slide, finally, and, and Monica hit on this a bit, but just our role um, and the other hat I wear of, of our department is, is consulting services. While we provide CE to build the knowledge and skills of our members, we also provide support through both structured and sort of informal consulting. Um, many inquiries that come to Rails often relate to like legalities in libraries and, and understanding that 
we are not attorneys. We have partnerships with organizations that uh, can provide that expert advice. So that's why we've created things like the Freedom of Information Act and Open Meetings Act hotline, excuse me, to, to give some assistance, again, from an attorney in this area. Uh, we have a relationship with HR Source, um, understanding that libraries often have a lot of, of issues and questions related to things, um, employment issues. Um, and just in general, as Monica said, being a place for libraries to turn, um, whether it's policy questions, best practices, even things like interlibrary loans. Uh, I looked in the last couple months, I've gotten around 70 consulting inquiries um, from our member libraries just on a whole variety of topics. And that doesn't include a lot of other rail staff who get these kinds of questions. And we really want to be that resource and sometimes, honestly, lifeline for our member libraries that might be in a difficult situation and just need somewhere to turn. So we take a lot of pride, I would say, in that role. So that's just a bit about consulting services. Karen, you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. So I will just say that you can find out more about everything you're hearing today on our website obviously and in particular we do have the, uh, so what we call post pages where we highlight uh, uh, you know currently trending you know uh, you know high interest topics you'll see the list there on the screen of what is uh, of high interest these days um, and then I do a regular podcast as well about different issues so I'll turn it back to Monica and we are on to strategic plan goal four, uh, and that is Rails leads alongside member libraries to develop and strengthen the Illinois library community and expand services to all. So again, this goal speaks to the need for Rails to collaborate with all of the other Illinois library leaders and leader organizations to find ways uh, and to find ways to expand service to the unserved in Illinois. As Deirdre mentioned in the beginning, this is something that is very important to Rails in our charge as well as important to the members and came out a lot in the strategic planning process. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, we just want to share a few of our collaborative efforts, uh, our annual certification process, of course, which is, is a, a huge uh, piece of work that our administrative team works on, um, the revising of system membership standards, our IELTS partnership, which we mentioned earlier, um, our collaborations with IACRL. Um, we also provide leadership and support to SLA, SLA the Special Libraries Association Illinois, uh, including Rails' own Dan Bostrom is the 2022 president of SLA. Um, we, Deirdre and I have regular monthly meetings with the Chicago Public Library Commissioner Chris Brown, which has been a wonderful addition that we have added in the last year, and Chris has been a great uh, partner for, for Rails. Um, we sponsor many library related conferences and our staff is very excited to get back out at some of the in person conferences that are coming up. Um, so we're really happy for that opportunity as well. Um, and we partner on grant initiatives with library related organizations, many, many, many of those, which we'll talk about as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to Anne, who can tell you a little bit more about L2. All right, thanks, Monica. Uh, so L2 is our statewide library directory and continuing education calendar at librarylearning.org. Um, it is a platform that's used by library staff throughout Illinois um, to find and register for continuing education programs um, and you know, look up and update information about their libraries and also used heavily by uh, system, state library, and LSAP staff to, in addition to our own continuing education opportunities and management of those, um, we also use it for internal meeting room reservations, um, and it's an important source of library data for us. Uh, so we host and manage the software, um, or the, the platform, uh, but it is very much a, a statewide project. Um, we have many, many organizations that are partners and stakeholders in this um, that uh, that all contributed to the process of redeveloping uh, L2 in 2020. Uh, we got a new technical backend and a new design, uh, all intended to 
make the whole thing more sustainable, flexible, and user-friendly. Uh, that was funded by the Illinois State Library. Um, and the Illinois State Library has supported L2 from its origins in about 2008. Uh, and we also do receive funding from the State Library for ongoing support and development, um, which, uh, which Sharon mentioned earlier that that grant uh, was just approved this week. So uh, hence why it was not budgeted um, when we submitted the budget in May. Uh, we also, uh, thanks to the, the new platform, have the ability to conduct the annual library certification process on L2. Uh, we did that for the first time in 2021. Uh, and that simplifies things for our libraries. They have a lot of reporting requirements that require uh, submission in various places using various platforms, and this is one small way we could help simplify that. Um, we, of course, have um, ongoing enhancements that we make. We continue working with our uh, vendor on that, and we have a statewide group that is established to help guide the product roadmap, um, evaluate and suggest potential changes, uh, participate in testing, and all of that, and uh, they are representative of, of the many stakeholder groups. Um, and finally, it is built on software uh, called Intercept that is a library calendar software um, that is currently uh, growing in use. Um, it was developed by the Richland Library in South Carolina, uh, along with the vendor we worked with, um, with a grant from the Knight Foundation. Uh, and there are more and more libraries starting to use it. It's open source, meaning that it's freely available to work with. And we at Rails are involved in that larger open source community for Intercept and, and uh, contributing back to that. And so I'm gonna pass it back to Deirdre now. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so one of the uh, things we heard loud and clear in the when we were doing the town halls for the strategic plan was that uh, members think we don't understand their needs as well as we should. And so we, we took that very seriously. And I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting, if you're a, if you're a small and rural library, which is um, noted up there uh, as one area of, 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 of needed focus, it was, you know, said to us that they they think we spend, you know, more most of our time on large, you know, uh, suburban libraries. <laughs> and if you talk to the large suburban libraries, they will tell you that we spend most of our time on small and rural libraries. Not to mention the academic libraries, the school libraries, and the specialized libraries. So clearly, it's a it's a it's a problem in every aspect of what we do, um, in the sense that we need to do a better job of understanding what the needs of all of our members are and making sure that they all in turn know about and understand what it is that we can do for them because and that means that we need to communicate better. So we are going to be doing some extensive uh, research this year into this um, because we want, we're always, you know, very focused on um, doing things that libraries need and being able to, you know, see the impact of those in, in helping libraries do a better job. So, and on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Grant, who is the key uh, person with um, helping us with data and using data to tell important stories about library land and libraries. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as highlighted before, the data team has doubled in size recently. <laughs> One, two, Jeanette, the data research specialist. We're grateful to have Jeanette on to focus primarily on the school data project for now, but eventually wade into all of the rest of the pieces of data, of rails evaluation and analysis involvement with data. And I can confidently say in just about 95% of all the programs and services you've heard about today, data has been in the background of all of those helping um, helping a lot of those projects along in various capacities uh, uh, along the way. Um, so primarily, not primarily, but um, often we're in internal Rails programs um, in the background doing analysis there, but we're also working to be more um, available to the members, um, providing data resources, 
training, consulting, um, hosting webinars. Um, we recently presented at the Director University, um, just getting the word about data, data literacy out um, to kind of build the data culture of libraries in Illinois. In Illinois. So um, always trying to create dashboards and reports to make data more available to all of our members, um, as well as surveys are a big thing in Rails, um, internally, externally, externally with our members. Um, we're constantly running surveys to gather feedback, analyze that feedback to improve all of our programming services, and just keep pushing um, with all the data that we can. Back to me. Thank you, Grant. Uh, so universal service, um, you know, a big project, a big important goal. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this uh, of this uh, PowerPoint, it is you know stated in the System Act that we it is our job to try to expand uh, uh, Illinois residents' access to public libraries, and so we do that through our Universal Service Committee. Uh, especially, but really through all of our committees, um, uh, resource sharing committee, uh, we just uh, uh, successfully advocated and assisted in the um, the expansion of the Cards for Kids legislation to be to be available to not just children below the poverty level, but it gives local boards of library trustees the the ability, they're, they're not mandated to, but they have a choice if they want to waive the fee for kids who are in unserved areas. We're very proud of that. We just won the McLaren Award for that, which is an, an ILA award. Um, and we will continue to work on statewide access to online resources for all libraries as well, state funded access. And I think that Dan is going to bring us home. <laughs> Thank you, Deirdre. Uh, yeah, just a few other communication and engagement tools that we think are important for board members to know about. Uh, so the first one is in 2022, we'll be updating uh, our website. This will this work will probably go through 2023 as well. Uh, my colleague Brian Smith has been working on this. We issued an RFP recently, and that work is very much uh, underway. Uh, the Rails E News uh, appears every Wednesday in your e in your uh, inbox, and uh, it goes out to around 6,000 people. Uh, it's a huge communication vehicle that we use uh, to reach our members and to kind of let them know what is going on. Uh, again, Deirdre, uh, Deirdre suggested reading that uh, every single week. I do think it's a, a must read for uh, system <laughs> programs and services. Um, we host regular member updates. These are system-wide forums where we talk about issues facing libraries. We talk about trends. We talk about interesting projects that are happening in our member libraries. We have one coming up on Thursday, September 29th. Would suggest that all of you, if you can, to attend. We always record them. They're always available uh, from the uh, Rails YouTube page, so you can watch uh, watch them there if you miss it. Uh, Monica mentioned this, but it bears repeating. Uh, Rails maintains a strong presence at all major conferences, uh, state level conferences, including IELE and, um, and ILA. Uh, we love interacting with our members there. Um, you see, you know, we, we do do, uh, you know, in-person and virtual site visits. We get a chance to see our members, but uh, for, for a lot of our employees uh, who work uh, behind the scenes uh, sometimes and uh, and don't don't get out to see our member libraries a lot. Uh, this is this is the best place for them to interact uh, with uh, with uh, staff from member libraries and kind of learn what's going on out there, see the programs, talk to them at exhibits. Uh, that's a real nice way to interact. Uh, and so we always try to make our, our presence as um, personal as possible at these conferences. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we do a nice job of that. Um, just a couple of things. We invite you to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, I, I Deirdre mentioned the podcast. I really like that as a as a way to kind of find out some stuff that's happening. It's a really personal way. Deirdre and I do uh, something called the Rails Minute, uh, which is a fun little video series uh, where we talk about what is happening at Rails. So uh, you can check those out. Um, again, make sure to subscribe and. I think that's it, Deirdre. Let's do questions. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> thank you, everybody. I I know that was long, but we do a lot of stuff, so there's a lot to tell you. Um, we we got some great questions as we went along. We're happy to answer questions now. 
but or maybe you just want to take a break first it's completely up to you i turn it back over to you mr president okay let's how about we take a break and go to come back at 11 15. perfect okay all right thanks everybody okay okay so do you have questions are you completely exhausted and want to think about it all or Yes. Hi, Renee. question. Uh, Renee, if anyone's on watching me. Um, so one of the things that I know that you mentioned where there, there's a lot of libraries that are somewhat concerned that they're not being, there's not attention paid to them. Mm -hmm. um, so when we were designing the website, did, are we, do we have like a, a brand ambassador who is focusing with the marketing aspect of it and making sure that both ends, both the printing, the physical and the online are meshed together? I think so. I don't know. Are you out there, Dan? I, I mean, we, we have a consultant that's that's yeah. um, going to help them. I, it's the same group that did L2. Um, so I'm assuming, yes, that we will look at both sides and user experience and the brand. And all. is that what you're Yeah, and it's essentially mean? also that covers the is it, uh, EDI. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. The EDI portion of, of course. it, making sure that. Yep. Right. And yeah. accessibility. I know that's yeah. been and a huge part of the conversation right. around the new website. And and Brian Smith, who is in charge of the website project, is part of the communications and marketing team. So there is sort of a natural affiliation right. also oh, right. with that yeah. group yeah. in terms of and how that consultant works. can can put in their work. But the issue is like if there's anyone from Rails that's actually oh, yes. making sure that everything is meshing together. Definitely. And, right. and our communications and marketing director, Mary Witt, who's not here today, she's on vacation, but that's a, like, she's all over that. That's her, that's her thing. Yeah. But thank you. That's a good question. I had a question about EDI consultants. Do we have like a list of vetted ones that libraries can like look at to see which ones would be best for their libraries? Or are we going to work on a list like that? for any libraries to consider? Because I know some of them have been going out of their way to do their own kind of research to find certain consultants. And I know some staff don't feel like they're still being heard by the consultants that they hire. So I don't know if there's like a ability for us to create that list for people to look at more closely. We have a consultants directory, just in general, online, on the website as part of the consulting page it's a little tricky sometimes in terms of vetting yeah. any kind of consultant because we don't we can't be in the position of endorsing you know people or not or the opposite of endorsing we've gotten into some interesting conversations with people who but that doesn't mean we can't provide you know, you know, resources. I mean, we, we clearly do that. I don't know what is out there now on uh, on the website for EDI. Yeah, I can share. Um, so when our EDI board committee first got started, we had three separate subcommittees. And one of the subcommittees, that was their primary charge. So it was creating um, essentially a database that would include right. One side of it was consultants or people who provided training to libraries and the other side is the programming side. Mm -hmm. So that is in process. So there's already, um, you know, a, a piece that our climate team is working on that is ready to be populated and has it in there. There's always a little bit, um, especially when it comes to performers identifying around identities and, and then that piece of it that's a little challenging. Yeah. So that's part of what we're looking at. Um, and as Deirdre mentioned, we can't, part of what we have to share is these are people who you know share this in in the area but we can't vet it or um recommend particular consultants based on that just because of our position yeah and we don't have the expertise mm -hmm. anyway we need consultants ourselves so mm -hmm. it's a, but resources definitely and the climate team is at work on that and it should hopefully be available yeah. and not too much longer okay cool thank you other questions about anything we've done so far or just anything that's in the back of your brain that you've always wanted to ask about rails <laughs> maybe nothing <laughs> um all right then so this next section is shorter and um then we'll have lunch this is a uh, really um it's also a lot more informal let's have a conversation stacy and i are going to are going to sort of tag team about you know, the meetings 101, board meetings 101, because uh, it's, um, there's some, you know, technological formalities and legal formalities and just things like the travel reimbursement form and that kind of stuff. So 
Um, she, you also handed out a document that has all this, this pertinent information. If, for those of you who aren't here, um, you got emailed to you. Do you have it, Juanita? What? And Rosie? Yes. Okay. So um, to start, you know, where to attend? Uh, obviously, big geographic area. Um, the Open Meetings Act, as it as it is in existence currently, uh, uh, permits library systems to have. Uh, what is not a physical quorum, as long as we have a, a uh, you know, not all of us in one place like we fortunately are today. So, but that if you, if board members are in a public, attending a board meeting in a public place, like a service center, and the, um, these days, one of our service centers, you count as part of the quorum. If you're attending on via Zoom from your office, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you don't count as part of the quorum, and we need a quorum, obviously, to have a meeting. And do what? What's the quorum number? Uh, a majority of the board, so, so eight. Eight. Okay. However, everything I just said is not currently in effect <laughs> because of the governor's proclamation, the uh, emergency proclamation that says we can meet remotely or in a high, you know, hybrid, whatever. So. For, and we, you know, he, this has been being promulgated monthly since I can't even remember when it wasn't being promulgated, unfortunately. Um, so we expect we check every month, and so we keep wondering, you know, when we'll have to go back to regular in, you know, meetings because it's more difficult to get a quorum. It just is um, because you can't attend from home. But there is an effort on the part of, I don't think just libraries to, but, but certainly it's, it came up at an ILA public policy uh, committee meeting. You, I think were there too, right, Julie? Uh, there is an effort to, to uh, sort of, you know, change the legislate, change the Open Meetings Act to allow these hybrid uh, uh, meetings because it, you know, but frankly, it's in some ways better for the public because it's easier to attend. We'll see how that goes. But just in the meantime, you know, we're going to keep going the way we've been going for all of what we can remember, at least all that I can remember, which is we can meet via Zoom if we need to. That may change and we'll let you know. Do you try? Yes. Um, I get that. Once it once this legislation goes away and it's back to regular, yep. Um, a place that you could attend that you could still be considered part of the quorum, but you attend remotely. What if you went to a, your public library? Does that doesn't count as? It has to be the Peoria it, one. No, or, no, it no. You can attend from your public library and still be considered part of the quorum. You can attend. It says right on here, down under options of where to attend a Rails board meeting, and the uh, you know the the second uh, okay. point there. Um, attend oh, via Zoom agenda. from a publicly accessible room at your public building. There must be audio access, so the public may attend the meeting as well. It has to be posted at the agenda 48 hours before the meeting. This does not make it easy, but it makes it possible. Okay. Um, obviously, you go to a rail service center, it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, you know, that's why I, I, I hope they do amend the law, but I just, I, you know, so. Okay. My name is Stacy Palmisano. I'm an administrative assistant, and I would introduce myself. Um, I am standing in place today for um, my supervisor, Emily Feister, who is the executive assistant, and she's going to be your main contact. We have a team of administrative assistants that are here for everyone um, that can help you at any time, but you'll mainly hear from Emily. So I'm just gonna quickly go over the options one more time. Um, you know, I provided the sheet for you because it's a great reference. And sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, wait a minute, what was this again? So this is gonna be a good reference for you. So as Deirdre had said, um, the options to attend Rails board meetings include committee meetings as well. So if you're on a committee meeting, it's the same rules apply. So number one <laughs> is the preferred option, which is attending a rail service center, which would be here in Burridge or East Peoria. Or Coal Valley, it has um, 
more staffing issues. So at this time, we are not opening that for meetings. And um, you just have to let us know usually Emily first, um, and then the team confirms the site to make sure that we do have staff at the East Peoria location. Of course, we're always gonna have staff here at Burridge. It's gonna be the main meeting site. And number two is the other option, kind of what we all just talked about, attending via Zoom in a publicly accessible room in a public building. Just to add a note, it does have to be a large enough room for the public to join. It can't just be you know, a study room with one seat. You do wanna have an opportunity for the members to come. So if you do choose that um, option, you just have to make sure that you have um, audio accessible, enough seating, and it's publicly noticed. To take, the agenda will be sent to you that wherever um, that building um, posts their agendas. Okay, and then the least one preferred, as uh, Deirdre had mentioned, is if you do have to join in your private location, you're not going to be counted toward the forum. Any questions about any of those details? Yeah, I have. I, I would certainly hate for my inability to come in person to mean that a board meeting didn't meet quorum. So I, how how far in advance, how would we know? Like if, 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 there's, <laughs> if there's worry that there won't be enough in-person, how would we know that? So that I is in like, your hands. Yes. That is in your collective hands. Okay. If you respond to Emily the first time she asks you, or even the second time, maybe even the third time, but preferably, <laughs> I'm not kidding, preferably the first time, what your situation, and obviously situations change, you know, things come up, you get sick, whatever. If you let her know what your plans are that you're going to attend and where quickly, soon, you know, then we will be able to give people that information. But if we don't have it, we can't tell you. So, so that's a, and I, on behalf of Emily, who is not here, I'm saying, please. Well, because I, I know as soon as school starts, it's going to be I know. very hard for me to drive an hour to get here for meetings during the school day. But I will, I again would never want to be the one who tipped the balance. Because um, what would happen in that case? Then that board meeting would not count or not happen or? Not, if there's no quorum, there's no meeting. There's no meeting. Okay. You okay. can't vote. I mean, there could you could have a meeting and talk about things, but that's kind of a. Yeah, there would be no, there could be no action taken. On right. Anything. Okay. Yeah. We can help you find a, a public space. Yeah. Near you, if you'd like. Right, I, I definitely am kind of like, you know, brainstorming, what would that look like if I ever had to right. um, to do that? Hope the it's, 48 it's hour never, thing. it's never happened. No? No, it's come okay. close, but it's never happened. Okay, to not having a quorum. Right. Okay. Uh, are you done? Yes. Okay, other questions about that? I know they don't make it easy, you know. Um, and as good, you know, good, important point, committee meetings as well, not just this meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, so in the folder, the very back on the right hand side, you will find two very important forms I've now lost. Um, oh, here we go. You will find this uh, reimbursement form which is also available online, right? No, Emily's going to email it to you. Sure, yeah, she'll email, email it to you. So fill this out. This is, uh, you know, the per this is for your travel to board meetings or committee meetings. Do you, well, a question about that. Yep. Stacy, do you think Emily wants it meeting to meeting or would she rather have it one filled out for like the six meetings? You can do it any way you want. I mean, what, I just didn't know what was easier for the, for accounts payable. To, to have Once it doesn't turn, matter it doesn't matter Once they turn it you turn it in then they'll process it okay if you'd like to have it continually you can easily do that as well it, okay. it doesn't matter to us okay yeah there's I have a quick question as well. yeah does it count for uh tollways or just the mileage to get here oh tolls yeah tolls, tolls yep. okay yep so that's very important and you know very easy for you to to do um, and okay, so we'll we'll save the rest of the folder until later. So going along, meeting, you know, continuing on meetings 101. Um, you talk about the the. Let me start off with the how to participate. Okay. okay. 
Um, so we, we encourage everybody to talk, obviously, um, when we're not all in the same place. It's 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 difficult, I think, to 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 be remote to get a word in edgewise sometimes, <laughs> or to be when we if we if we do go back if you know to having people at various other sites. I'm sure you guys can speak to that when you're not here yeah. with a lot of people. When you're in East Peoria, you don't necessarily have the same ability to to make a point. Yes. And if you're in East Peoria and the meeting's going on here, uh, don't even try to make a motion because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. There's, there's a there's delay. A there's so a, we and a, so we try to remember. We put it in the annotated agenda, which Stacy's going to talk about in a minute. You know, check with remote sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's just you it, when there are, when you're with a group of people in a room, you just just kind of leaves your mind, it leaves your brain that there are other people. Like hi Juanita. <laughs> Hi, Rosie. <laughs> it's just it's just human nature, I think, you know, so you have to really assert yourself. There is a delay when you're if you're in if you're at a, a, a service center and just a couple of seconds. Right, Brian, but it's enough um, to to make it a difference sometimes. Um, the microphones are very sensitive. Um, and I would say also on on Zoom. Um, we can hear whispering. We can we can hear what people are saying sometimes. So just be very careful if you're you know you think you're you're whispering, but it doesn't come across as a whisper. We don't want anybody to embarrass themselves. Um, also, not supposed to have side conversations anyway at an open meeting because if you're having a you know if you guys are having a conversation, the public has no access to that. It's I mean sometimes you have, want to ask a question. You can't get a word in. It's inevitable, but just remember that the microns, the microphones are very sensitive, and we, you know, you will be overheard, and it, you, you might not want that to happen. And you get picked up on closed caption. Yeah, <laughs> and then you get picked up on closed. Now you cannot really escape. So yes. So, um, go ahead, Stacy. Okay. So annotated agenda. Basically, this is a script. This is an example of it. This is the agenda, and then in the red, and then I also have some blue on here, is created for the president of the board, as well as any of the committee chair people. So when you host a meeting, or you're the chairperson, this is created to you by the admin staff, and it really goes through step by step, because as you kind of can tell in the beginning of meetings, there's certain things we need to say, and we follow that. It's much easier for everyone, because there's no question. We even put little pauses in there to help you along so that opportunity to ask a question or wait for an answer, okay? And that is created for every board meeting and every committee meeting, okay? You won't see that if you're not the chair. At the meetings, um, if you're familiar with a motion and a second, that'll happen. So for example, um, when a motion is asked, um, you respond by saying, so moved, Stacy." And the second person will say, second, Deirdre. I think that most of you probably have been to meetings that you've heard that, but anyone can do that. And you just go ahead and step in and then it's noted in the uh, minutes. And then um, the chairperson will ask for discussion of vote or a vote. Okay, any questions on that part? And this is, I mean, really, we ask you to say your name. It makes it easier for the, the right. note taker because they don't necessarily, you can't always tell who it is if you're not in the same room. And then after the report, staff and the board members will ask if you have any questions. So feel free to ask any questions um, at that time. Okay, now we'll move on to video conference locations and sensitive microphones. Which we, I, I pretty, yeah, I think we've talked about that enough. Okay. Um, questions about any of that so far? Any, any additional questions? Okay. Um, okay, email accounts. <clears throat> You're, you'll get a separate um, email account. Um, IT will work with you. You should, should already have Today, oh, okay. If you don't, come see me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he will help you set it up so that you can access it however you wanna access it. Um, 
the reason that you have to have a, se a separate account is for your own good. Um, if we get FOIA'd, they, you know, all of our communication will come to you via your, your, your board account. You don't want it to come to your uh, personal account in case you, we get FOIA'd for something. You don't want that to, you know, to get into your, your, your personal account. Uh, we learned this the hard way a number of years ago when we had a very bad run of terrible FOIA requests, um, very destructive FOIA requests, not just for us, the library world uh, in general in Illinois. It hasn't happened in years. I'm, I'm thinking maybe seven, eight years that was now. But this is just for your own convenience and safety. And also for us in terms of in, in, when if we when we get a FOIA request because everything is is on the rails email our IT department can just easily you know get the relevant electronic records i mean you know one of the one of the requests you know back in that bad day was they wanted every email from you know a number of of rails staff that included the words thank you now we are, of course, very polite people, librarians, and we always say thank you. It might even be part of our signature or something, you know, was thousands and thousands of email requests. And if we hadn't had the ability to do it that way, it would have been even worse than it already was. So, um, right, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's for your own, again, your own good and convenience um never reply all that's a violation of the open meeting act right there um or it can be because it, it could result in you doing business online via you know via email so i mean board business questions about any of that it's not a question but what happens every so often like a strange email that comes to my rails account and if I'm not sure, I usually send an email to Emily and say, is this familiar? Good. I don't open it. Yep. And usually she'll say yes or no. And then usually Emily forwards it to IT to verify. Is yeah. It for me, okay. for That's me, very, you know, yeah. Step in. Um, but a quick note, if you do hit reply all, just to let you know, Doesn't generally it will not work because right. uh, it's basically the Rails board emails are part of a secure group. And Emily has to approve all outside messages that go to that group. So just FYI, don't just have to do it, but just in case, you know, it is moderated. And um, Deirdre, just a quick rewind to uh, attendance in person at committee meetings. Is that also required in person? The quorum, it, we, quorum it, the same quorum that. rules apply, which okay. means like right now it's not an issue. Okay. How many people serve on each committee? It just, it varies. It varies. Yes. Okay. So whatever is the majority of that. Yeah. And, and those committee meetings happen here? Well, um, they are currently happening, pre, you know. Yeah. Zoom, pre okay. Some happen here. Okay. Some are all Zoom. I but how, how, how would that count for Zoom then? Well, right now, Zoom counts as a, we can use oh, Zoom right. to Got achieve okay. a quorum. Okay. But if the if when when if right when and if that lapses yeah. or isn't changed. Okay, right. got it. Right. It you know we do ask that you check your e your your Rails email regularly. We don't send a lot of emails, but one of those emails will be Emily asking if you're attending the meeting. And if you wait until the day before the meeting every month to open your your email, that won't be helpful. That's why we want to make it easy for you to be able to access your Rails email and see when you get things. And especially in the headline it says something about a doodle poll make, make <laughs> yeah. sure don't i mean just don't even just go do it right then. <laughs> thank you <laughs> i think that's meetings 101 right more questions yes there's been I, I know i've noticed that there's been some links that have been going to like i don't know if it's called mindcast oh I mean, can't Good do question. Yes, uh, Mindcast is our email security solution. Um, if, if you know any link that comes into your Rails email address is um, Mindcastified, basically it's secured. So if you click on it, it'll have the Mindcast. Um, if you you know 
if you forward that email that's not your personal account, it will not work because of that security. So if you open, if you open the link from your Rails email address directly, it should prompt you to do a, a one-time setup on, on your device to allow it through. Yeah, because I, I would think I wanted it to, I put my email address and mm -hmm. it's, it wasn't working. And I, I was very, uh, I was, I was very sad that I couldn't order lunch. That happened to you too? Uh, during our break, I'll, 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 I'll work with you. Oh, sure. no. <laughs> now that is a serious problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like here, just these are the selections. <laughs> yeah, tell me what you want. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll work during, during our break to All right, no problem. make Thank sure you. you're good to go. Yeah. Mine, mine go to my spam folder. That was causing me a lot of stress and then i found out the authentication we're in spam so. do not hesitate to ask us ever i mean emily in particular will become a very close <laughs> confidant and dear friend <laughs> yeah. yeah i would say when i called it they were wonderful they were really nice and patient and very helpful so yes of course say that out. <laughs> when you call the it number you know every phone it rings you know i'm, I'm generally the first person who will answer but if, I, if i'm not it's usually my, my boss. this is ryan i don't know if you met him hello ryan. I'm ryan. <laughs> ryan knows many many important things <laughs> There is a question from Rosie in the chat. Oh, yes. You know what, um, she just said, do we have a list of board meetings for the year? Yeah, we're uh, going to get to that. That's on the board agenda later on this afternoon. Yep. The real meeting. Excuse me. Rosie also, this is Jody, had another question about the mileage form oh. reimbursement yep. and the form that you receive electronically should automatically cal calculate that mileage. Yes. Well, it'll calculate the amount you get for the mileage you drive. Yeah. You, you, have to, you have to figure out how much you actually drive. Well, that, yes, right, sorry, yes. You have to figure out how many miles you drove and then it will figure it out. If Emily hasn't sent it to you already, she will be sending it to you in email. Okay. If you don't get it, she'll send it to you in email. Yep. Okay. Um, in past years, we've... Uh, had a had a sort of an informal buddy system for new board members. Um, Diane reminded me of this because and you know and I know you've been a lot of people's buddy. You maybe yes, had your own buddy at one point. Yes, I did. Um, so uh, you know if you want to if you want to figure that out and you know new board members over lunch. If, <clears throat> or just thinking about it, if you think you'd like to have somebody in particular you can go to, of course, I mean, we we can help you with that, but it's completely up to you to, uh, to just try to get a better understanding of rails and connect with your colleagues or. Honestly, Tom and your folks in my life for the last two years, I don't get something like that. Tom, do you have time to talk? <laughs> Explain this to me for one on one. <laughs> what does this mean? So it's been very helpful. And I'm happy to do it. it. <laughs> Just to clarify for the Open Meetings Act, one and one trustee and one trustee can communicate. If we have more than two, then it considers a meeting and then it's a violation. Well, it becomes when you get to a majority of a quorum, which would be three. Oh. that that would be like you're you're you can't do yeah i know but 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 you know obviously you're going to you, you know you're going to be you know potentially at a conference in one place you'll be talking about you know maybe it, you know things happen it just don't feel like the the library or the FOIA. i mean the oma police are at. just you know better to not put yourself in situations where you know that's unavoidable so okay Anything else on that part? Okay, so then we'll take a look at the folder and then we'll be done. And mine is completely out of order now. Yours still in order, Monica? Okay, let me see. So, um, okay, so on the left side I, of the folder, I think a lot of the first two documents we've already been through, the agenda and the orientation, the PowerPoint, the next here is your is just what we've put together as a job description for you. Um, oops, I don't know if you have had a chance to look at this. 
um, again, it it talks about the you know who's on the board, you know the different uh, the different seats, um, the general duties that we talked about a little bit during the the PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Um, things that we ask you to do, like be the ambassador, attend conferences, go to networking meetings. I know that some of our board members, our current board members have had have had fun and learned a lot going to some of Dan's networking meetings, going to some of the local networking group meetings, uh, member updates. I mean, all of the things that we do, we welcome you to attend. And um, we do them for all members. And the more you know, the better uh, board member ambassador you can be. So don't hesitate to do that. Um, please come to the meeting. You know, please attend meetings. Obviously, that's kind of the basic uh, job responsibility. <laughs> um, you'll, there's a conflict of interest form that's in your in the folder that you need to file. Right, looks like this. Right with the hi Becky. Hi. Right with the reimbursement form. There is an annual statement of economic interest that's required, and you, you don't have to worry about that. When we when it's time for you guys to do that, we will let you know. If it comes to us, and then we send it out to you. Um. I can't think of anything else here that we haven't already talked about. On the conflict of interest form, do you want to explain how involved it is versus the, the conflict of interest with the statement the, of economic the, interest? Yeah, the statement. I was of hoping to avoid that. Oh. I know they've revised it and it <laughs> yeah. is much more complicated now, but. Um, Maybe Juanita's the uh, expert. You want to talk about that, Juanita? <laughs> statement of economic I interest. I did have to do one as the manager of the law library and I did see that it is much more detailed now like it's asking very specific questions about investments, et cetera, et cetera. So I have done it this year for the law library. So at least I, I am familiar enough with it so to do it again, but yeah, it, it was very detailed. And um, some people have complained that, um, or wanted to consult an attorney before they filled it out. We did have our attorney do uh, an FAQ about it because you can be, you can come to some conclusion. It is a state form and is of course bureaucratic and dense. It's hard to understand what they're asking for sometimes. So Julie Tappendorf did explain that, yes, it may be a question about investments, but there's a lot of exclusions. You don't have to talk about this or this or this or this. So I think that is very helpful too. Um, so when the time comes, you know, we'll we'll help you with that. It's but there's, you know, it's a requirement if you're going to be a public official, which you are now elected public officials. There was something else I was going to say about that that you told us um, in the FAQ. Just, I mean, there's a lot of you don't have to. I mean, it sounds like you have to give them your whole like, you know, tax income tax statement, you know, but you don't. It's just that. Oh, I know. I was just going to say, ironically, this comes out of the Secretary of State's office, <laughs> you know, the state librarian. So <laughs> that we've done it to ourselves. Um, <laughs> um, OK, let's see. Then there's a, all the committee membership and charges. There's a, a couple of pages of that still on the left hand side. Um, the advocacy committee, consortia. We'll, we'll talk about this more this afternoon too, about who, who has interest in which committee, equity, diversity, and inclusion. The executive committee is a little bit different. It's made up of the officers and the past president generally. Policy committee is gonna spend this year working on the election process and some other interesting topics. Uh, the Rails Resource Sharing Committee, and then the Universal Service Committee. So that's all of our committees. Um, there is a list of when they meet. This is as of, as of now. I mean, that could change the end of this year or next year. 
then is our system area and per capita grant it's, it's it says 3.0 system operational plan this is what we the main part of what we have to submit every year is part of the area and per capita grant this is what we're going to do every year and we have to also include where how this applies to the illinois library system act and the administrative rules so that's the left hand side and then on the right hand side is some of some information materials about what you heard about today related to training our services our bylaws which have the board bylaws so the system bylaws which also includes um, a lot of about the uh how the board works and the nominating committee, how people, how that's all, how the election is done currently. The administrative rules, which are, um, there's statute and then there, which is like the system act, but then the Illinois, the state library, the secretary of state's office create kind of the implementation guidelines, which is what basically what administrative rules are. So it says, you know, it has says the you know rails uh, will uh, support resource sharing, and then this in the system act essentially, and then this kind of says more about that um, through delivery, through interlibrary loan, through non-resident borrowing. But so it's a, sort of the the meat on the bones essentially. Um, then there's the administrative rules related just to this board. Um, I know there's a lot. And then there's the uh, the system act itself, our Bible, so to speak. And then the last document is the recently enacted public act 102-0843, which is the expansion of the Cards for Kids Act, which was just passed. That's a lot, I know. I think we're done though. <laughs> Questions? The test document is behind the right. The test? Yeah, the test that they have. <laughs> All right, documents. yes. I think, you know, take it home, look it over, call me when you have questions. I have one additional yeah. comment about the committee meeting. Schedule we decided to conclude this year. This is, these are all approved oh. meetings from the committee. Sure, for, I'm getting it uh, this year, quite, quite free. Now, even if you're not on the committee, all is welcome to join, and you will receive an email from the administrative yeah. assistant that it works for that committee, um, inviting you as well. But this is a heads up in case you put on your calendars. Okay, that's all. And they're fun to attend, even if you're not a member. I mean, they're that might be it. some very interesting topics come up at those meetings. Yeah, uh, Stacey, I'm noticing that different committees have different numbers of meetings. Is that is there a certain number of meetings that set, or it's just whatever that group decides? That's right. It's okay. all dependent on that group. Okay. Well, that may change with new chair people right. on the group. Issues come up. Issues go away. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. And That's it. Any questions? Any, any other questions? Okay. Thank you all for being so patient. Yes, and I thank hope. and thank you, the rail staff, for uh, hanging by for so long with us today <laughs> and uh, providing all this input for us today. Uh, and I, we're getting close to noon, so I think it's probably, if there are any more questions, uh, we'll adjourn. Oh, I just thought of one. Um, Open Meetings Act certification. Mm -hmm. If we're already certified for our send library, it to Emily. can I just send it? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I did yeah, I did the that. same thing. Yeah. yeah. I do not want to take that. <laughs> um, I think only the secretary has to redo it, right? Or not. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not going to, I don't yeah. know. And Emily's not here. She would know. I had my. We can find out. Mine out. Um, 
And if anybody wants a tour, maybe after lunch, before the meetings, the next meeting starts at one. But if anybody wants a tour of the building, happy to do that. Maybe at you know, twenty to one or something like that. Okay. Uh, now I'll stop talking. Really. Okay. Thank you all for your attendance today, and we officially adjourn this meeting at 11.58. <laughs> See you later.